If you are not relaxed, you cannot what? Receive. So be relaxed. Tell you, never be relaxed. No tension. No stress. The Bible says, wisdom is the principal thing. Get wisdom and get what? Understand. Proverbs 4, 7. In all that getting, get understanding. And that is what we have come to get today. So tell anybody, I'm, I've come to get understanding today. And I will get it. Say, I will get it. Say it with confidence. I will get it. I will get it. In the name of Jesus, I believe you get it. All right. So without wasting too much of time, I want to bring to the podium quickly. Uh, is Pastor Nee's slide ready? Okay. Amen. So ladies and gentlemen, can you just rise to your feet and let's give him a sincere welcome. <laughs> Pastor Nee Adesoya. Thank you. Thank you. You may take your seat. Thank you so much for um, the CCI. Are we? CCI. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm really, I'm really grateful for this opportunity to be here. I've been longing for this wonderful opportunity for a very long time. And I was wondering why Pastor I am. Pastor Bossy has not, have not invited me. But... Now God has, God has answered my prayers. <laughs> God answered my prayers and I'm going to be with you guys for two days. What a wonderful time we're going to have in the presence of God. Now, one of the things that will happen, uh, well, let me, let, me, let me appreciate Pastor Ayo and Pastor Bosser for bringing me, for allowing God to use them to answer my prayers. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, ma. And then all the associate pastors also, thank you. Really appreciate you. Um, get, I didn't get the memo. I was trying to be very, 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 you know, when you're coming to a place where you've been longing to come, so you dress properly. If I'd known, I would have worn my jeans also, because I have some few. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much. Thank you. Now, it's a journey. We're going to take a journey, and then hopefully, by the grace of God, hopefully, I believe that everybody here will live here with a sense of purpose, with a sense of progress, and then you will have the tools that you need to be able to make the transition, because most of the time, people do not know how to make the transition, and then they have all the so-called knowledge, they have everything coming at them at every point in time, but they do not know how to translate it. That's why the Bible says, the labor of the foolish weary at him because he does not know how to go to the city. You see, when he was still laboring, he was not a fool. When he was coming to church, he was not a fool. When he was praying, he was not a fool. When he was reading the Bible and everything, he was not a fool. But as soon as he couldn't translate the prayers, into result. He couldn't translate the fasting into result. He couldn't translate the knowledge into tangible results. Then he became a fool. Even the Bible says that um, the world became flesh and he moved into the neighborhood. The word of God became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. That tells us something that whatever we do in life, there must be an ability to be able to translate it into results. I am not a man given to rhetorics. I'm a man given to results. One of the things that has helped me so far in my journey in, uh, I mean, the knowledge industry in Nigeria, one of the things that has helped me so far is that anybody that comes close to me, they get results. I had the privilege of signing my first, um, my first big ticket um, client in London. And then how did it happen? Just mess sitting down with me and then talking, and then she was supposed to pay a particular 15,000 pounds for something, 
And then when we sat down together, just one meeting, she was able to save 9,000 pounds. I mean, immediately. So now registering for my think tank was not a big deal because the think tank was now registered. She registered for 10,000 pounds. I've already saved you now anyway. <laughs> so you can see that, that it is not rhetoric. It's more about tangible results. And I pray today, by the grace of God, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, every one of us here will see tangible results in our lives in the next um, 30 days, in the next um, um, two years or something, but you will see results in your life. Um, please note this, that whatever we're teaching today, tomorrow, is not going to be abracadabra. It's not going to be something that you just um, see results instanta. I'm not the one giving to today. Today, not tomorrow. Jesus will answer you today, today. You know, I know everything must just happen today. No, that is not my own way of doing things. My own way of doing things is you practicing the principles over and over and over and over again, and then you're getting results. But there are also shortcuts to practicing the principle. Not shortcut in the name of um, the real sense of shortcut or circumventing the process. Is just knowing how best to get to the city. Because you can trek to the city. You can use a car to the city. You can use a train to the city. And you can fly a plane to the city. Everybody gets to the city. But when did you get to the city? So if you decide to go with a plane, you will be faster than the body, somebody who decided to walk. You will be faster than somebody who decided to use the car. Because, because of the speed of the vehicle with which you deploy in getting into the city. And that's what I want to do today, tomorrow, by the grace of God, get you into not just a plane, into a jet. And those of us who know Concord those days, uh, a rocket, I mean, boom, right, get you right there into your destiny. And then you begin to fulfill your life purpose and then you become an influential person. Is that okay? Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you. We bless and we magnify you. We ask, oh God, that you anoint my lips of clay and let me speak the word in due season to the weary soul. Thank you, Heavenly Father, because no man will live here the same way they came in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Bless the reading of your word. Bless the preaching of your word and bless the listening to your word tonight, to this morning in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' precious name, we pray. Let me say this by the, for the reason of um, um, articulation and for the reason of um, influencing you to pay attention to some of the things that I'm going to be teaching. And I think right now in Nigeria, God has so blessed me and blessed my organization that we are kind of, kind of leading in the industry that we have found ourselves in Nigeria. And that happened within the space of three years. And then the, the secret to that we will share, and yeah, because leadership is all about taking the lead. Leadership is all about being exceptional. Leadership is all about influence. Leadership is all about dictating the pace in your industry, dictating the pace in your career, detecting the pace in your organization. That's what leadership is all about. And then we're, we're going to, um, God has really helped us to do that. And I mean, right now, to the glory of God, I think God has enabled us to be able to say that we have the highest paying coaching platform in Nigeria. Highest paying coaching platform in Nigeria. And then again, we are able to say also that we have uh, the highest paying event, knowledge event in Nigeria. Now, I mean, it's not just a knowledge event that you have where two or three are gathered. You have um, in their hundreds, and they are paying huge amount of money to be in that space, in that space. Now, God has enabled us to do that, and then that, that, that's the grace that I came here with. And then we need to realize that. And you see, the grace we find expression in our different lives. Probably you are an employee. The grace will find expression in your life that you become the highest paid in your organization. Uh, 
Even if you are not the highest paid when it comes to salary, you become the highest paid when it comes to commission. Mm. I mean bonuses. You become the most outstanding. And then in your field, whatever you find yourself, whether you are an hairdresser, whether you are a skin therapist, whatever they call them, you know, or whether you are anything in any field that you have yourself, you're doing, you'll find out that you'll become the number one or the most outstanding person in that field. Everything is based on principles. Everything is you knowing what to do, how to go about it, and then you will be very okay. Now, I came here to teach in this, but I have a slide. But since I know that I'll be doing the first session, am I right? And do the second session today. So then there will be the third session tomorrow. No problem. If you, if you give me the fourth session and the fifth session, I will do it. I'm the one given to talking. There was a day I was talking in Portacot at my program. And then when we looked at the time, we have done five hours. I wasn't tired. They were not tired. Because you expect your crowd to be tired. Since they were not tired, we were not tired. I was not tired. Then, ah, what's happening? Five solid You are rest assured that when you get to the production, the product line of they coming out, you are rest assured that it must be the same thing. Now, there are room for errors, but because you follow the processes, you reduce your error rates drastically. And same thing with life. When you read the scripture, you are asking yourself the question, what is the instruction that is given to me? 
what do I need to do either to make this happen or to quicken or fasting the rate of making this happen. So basically, somebody who wants to succeed, whether in leadership or anything in life, focuses on their soul. And then in Sunday school, I'm sure Pastor Ayo and Pastor Bosse has been able to teach us this several times, that the prosperity of your soul actually rests on three things. Your soul is your intellect, your emotion, and uh, your will. Your intellect, your emotion, and uh, your will. So what you need to do to be successful in life is to pay attention to your intellect. Once your intellect prospers, you have done one third of the job. Once your emotion is balanced, in other words, you are not emotionally moved by things. You're not emotionally moved by the trends on social media. You're not emotionally moved by, by, by somebody um, somewhere who is your neighbor and doing something more than you because anybody who makes your emotions move right or left or up and down is actually in control of your life. You know what that means? You have handed the remote control of your life to that person. So whatever the person mute, mute you, you are mute. Without the person reduce your volume, your, your volume has reduced. And that is too much power to give to people. Many of the things that in our lives that have caused diseases were not um, airborne diseases. They were not most of the time not even infectious diseases. They were most, mostly the diseases that we got based on our unbalanced emotion. Unbalanced emotion. You know, sometimes you go to the hospital, they do all the tests, they can't find anything, but you are still sick. So it's not the sickness of the body, it's the sickness of the mind. Once your emotions is not balanced, you know what that means? That means you will not have the sound else that the Bible is talking about in 3 John verse 2. Once your emotion is not balanced, you cannot have savings. Because you will always look at my life, whatever I do, you want to do. Whatever I don't do, you don't do. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm spending probably my ROI, high, my return on investment, but you are spending your capital, your principal. And then you look at you, how can you be prosperous in that way? You know what? It does not matter whether you buy a new car or not. That should not move me. If you're buying a new car, it makes me feel inferior or makes me feel as if I've not accomplished anything. Prosperity is far from you. Prosperity is far from you. You can see where the emotional balance is right now. You can see that. And then it went on to say something about strong will. Your will. Your will. Everybody knows that nobody gets into the pinnacle of wealth. Nobody gets into the point where they begin to control billions or multi-million in any currency, except Zimbabwe currency anyway. When you begin to control millions and multi-million, billions, if you do not have courage, courage is strong will. Courage is your ability to bite the bullet. Courage is the ability to damn every consequences and move on based on your conviction. Nobody can be extraordinary rich without going in the way of courage. You must be ready to fail sometimes. You must be ready to, to, to be called names sometimes, and then you must move most of the time against the tides. And that is where the strong will comes in. Now, all these three things must be strengthened. All these three things must be empowered, because if they are not empowered, then sound else and prosperity is absolutely far. Now, intellect, how knowledgeable are you? How knowledgeable are you? How do you, what do you read? What do you invest in your mind? Who are the people that you engage constantly? Who are your friends? What do you discuss? What do you discuss? Do they affect you intellectually? Are your discussion very profitable? 
Do you discuss about people or you discover projects? Do they share with you the investment opportunities that are there? Look, the wealthy man and the poor man or the extraordinary wealthy man or the successful man is not more brilliant than you are. That I can confess to you. But they just happen to be at a place where some information has been shared. Yeah, that's why I always tell people that the secret to wealth actually is privileged information. Privileged information. Privileged information. That's why some people will do everything within their power to get into some privileged environment. Look, I always tell my guys this in the office. When I want to go, I mean, just want to go spend a weekend in a cool hotel. And at the point that they were arguing, ah, this money is too much, this money is too much. They say, relax, you don't know this game. We understand this game. Just pay it. So I forced them to pay the first one. So when I came back, with deals. Next time I told them, okay, I'm going to a cool hotel. They didn't argue. You know why? Why you are having breakfast in that place? Somebody somewhere will walk in. And then you will have some engagements, some discussions that will throw the whole thing up. There's a place to encounter some privileged information. I have, a, I have a gubernatorial aspirant right now troubling me to help them develop. They have been develop his manifesto or his, uh, um, he said he was going to send me his five-point agenda. How did I meet him? I met him in the business class, seated right, right next to him, and we flew for the five minutes Lagos to Abuja. So many years back. That was a privileged environment. And then I met a privileged person who is opening up for me. He will give me a privileged information. And who is opening up for me an ability or an opportunity to get into a state probably next year as probably the advisor to the governor. Because how can I do the manifesto? And I now tell him that as Joseph, oh, I'm the one, I'm interpreting your dream. I'm the one that can implement your dream. <laughs> I'll be foolish to not put myself there. Uh, I, must, I must be foolish. <laughs> and then, does this stand a chance to win? Yeah, because his state, the party that he got the ticket, is the one controlling the state. So, you know, how you look, look at your chances. So, I will talk more about that probably on Sunday. Everyone is actually looking at where they, how to get yourself into that place where privileged information are released. Privileged information. Don't forget our intellect. Intellect. You must increase in your knowledge. You must increase in your ability to gather information. You must increase in your ability to interpret information. Because sometimes it's not just in gathering information. Don't worry, don't worry about the kids. Eh? You're concerned about them. Just leave them. Let them enjoy themselves. You know, the Bible says that um, when Peter was going to drive them away from Jesus, what did Jesus say? Leave them alone. Mm. And he, was, he now used them as an example. If you can be free like this in the presence of your father, you get a lot of things. <laughs> so, Lord, leave them. Don't let us, I'm okay. I'm at home. Did Pastor you tell you I'm a member of this church? He didn't tell you. I'm a member of this church. Right from a long time ago. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Oh, did you get what I'm trying to teach here? So increase your ability to gather information. Information is key. Information is everything. Everything. But you must know where the information is have been um, dispensed, has been um, released, you must know where, and you must get yourself in that mix. Now, 
there is this study that I carried out. And I, I tried to understand the 1% of the world's population. Because actually, it's a very interesting data that all of us need to be very much interested in. Something drops out. Very much interested in. There is the 1% one popula one population of the world that controls like approximately 50% of the wealth of the world. I mean 1%. Isn't that, isn't that terrible? 1% controls um, almost 50%, 49 point something percent. Let's just give them 50%. While 10% of the population of the world controls 80 5%. If you add them to the 1%, they control 85% of the world's wealth. Now, when you now bring it down to 30% of the world's population, those ones now controls 97% of the wealth of the world. While 70% of the world's population are grappling with 3% of the world's wealth. That is just what the Bible say, it means when it says the rich. <laughs> he that has we have more. And he that does not have, even that which he has shall be taken. So, the question now is, where are you? Are you 70%? 30%? 10%? Or 1%? The 1% are the people who make a million dollar and above annually. And that means that based on, no, 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 I don't like talking about this black market uh, conversion. So let me stay with the official rate conversion. That means they make 410 million naira annually. 1%. Now, amongst this 1%, there's another 1% of the 1%. They call them the ultra high net worth individuals. Those ones are, would make like $30 million and above every year. Don't let us even go there. Let us even stay with the 1%. That make a million dollar and above. Now, the 10% makes a $100,000 annually and above. Now you can convert that, and that's about 40, am I right? $100,000 and above, that's about 40 something million there. Yeah, 40, 40, let's just say 41 million there. I'm okay. 41 million there annually. Now, do you fall into that category? Those two set of people, they control 85% of the wealth, 85 or 83% of the, I don't know the actual figures right now. They control 85 to 83, 83 to 85% of the wealth. At least, if there is any place you want to be, you want to be in the 10% category. Minimum. You don't even want to be in the 30%. Although the 30% control 97%. Now, look at it. 85, 97. That means the 20% the that we now added to them are controlling a, a less than... Um, Less than 12%. Yeah. There is always problem at the base. Enjoyment is at the top. Even in your organization. The enjoyment is at the top. So if you want to start enjoying, you need to start talking to yourself and figuring out what are the strategies? What are the things that I need to do to make me get to the top? Because enjoyment is at the top. Those guys practically don't spend their salaries. Their vacations are taken care of. And then you begin to look at them and you begin to say something that monkey they walk, babu they chop. That's your problem. Enjoyment is at the top. So you want to enjoy life, you want to be outstanding, you always must have your strategy to get you to the top. And the top 
is minimum 10% or 1% of the world's population. Now, it will shock you that the people, no, 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 there are two categories now. Let me even break down the 1%. Let me even bring it down further. There are two categories of people. There are people who make a million dollars and above yearly, but there are some other people who are worth a million dollars and above. The people who make a million dollars and above that happen to be 1%. Now, when I say 1%, not 1% of the world's population. It's actually 1% of the working population. So when you take them from the age that you can walk, 16 or 18 years and above. So you have about 5 point something billion of those people. Now, 1% of those people are about 56 to 58 million people who are in that 1% bracket. Are we together? Now, there was a time that Credit Suisse said something about the fact that the, the, the number is going to increase. It did increase. But the question now is, how many people were able to break free from the 10% to join the 1% or probably from the 30% to join the 1% or the 10% or from the 70% to join the 10%? How many people were able to break free from that? And one thing you also need to realize that if I'm in the 1%, I'm programming my son and my daughter to be in the 1%. So your chances of being in the 1% is actually reduced. Why? Because I have the privilege. I have the privilege of paying for Harvard for my children. I have the privilege of paying for Princeton for my children. I have the privilege of sending them to the best of the best schools or getting them exposed quickly than you would. So if you do not have all those things, what you need to do is to start thinking about some catalytic strategies uh, that will quicken and fasten your rate to get in there. Before you think that where do I fall, whether 10% or 1%, let me tell you my history. I was born into a very poor family. Sorry, did I say poor? I take that back. We were not poor, we were poor. Poor. In other words, we're so poor that poor people looked at us and they called us poor. Oh, you didn't get that. I mean, where's the poor area in Suriname? Get that place and then go there. And then you now see poor people load by definition. They now tell you that you are now asking them, who are the poor people in this vicinity? They now point to us. <laughs> that was how bad the situation was. You know, you eat this uh, three square meal, one, one, one. We, we don't even have zero, zero, one. Neither do we have one, zero, zero, zero. Or anything that you get, whether half or t you are thanking God. I don't know whether you've been in the situation where you went to buy, those days we went to buy a bar intentionally. And they will be arguing with the lady who is selling the soup. F bless you. F bless you. Uh, they will tell you, how much uh, Eba did you buy that you are asking for more? <laughs> but you know the purpose. You know the reason. F bless you. Because you know that there is gari at home. But there is no soup. So you need that F bless you. Because this obey that I'm buying, this stew that I'm buying, is not just for this one Eba that I'm buying here. I have a drum of gari that I'm going to prepare. To, and then when you even, after they have um, added more stew to it, you now take it home. Add water to it and salt. <laughs> that was my situation. That was my situation. You now add water and salt and then... By the time you mount the eba, even after you have mounted the eba, you are even stylishly using the stew. Eba is as big as this, and the stew you use is as small as this. Because this mountain must be leveled. <laughs> I mean, it was that bad. It was that bad. But then, Things changed. One which we will introduce you, Jesus Christ made the change. That's one. And again, after Jesus Christ has made the change, he begins to open you up to some particular kind of influences. Particular kind of influences. And then we must understand that as we move on, on this, our journey. So when I say 
1%, 10% or this or that, don't think that I flew from a very rich family. And then I did a study further. I did some research further. Apart from the ones, forget about the few, the ones who make $1 million and then the one who keep $1 million. The people who make $1 million are about $56 million. The people who actually are worth $1 million are about $20 million in the whole world. Mm. In Nigeria, it's even worse. And then with this black rate, black market rate, that has even reduced our Naira further. Mm. I think this research idea, I can't remember the numbers right now. In Nigeria, I think you have just about, is it 10,000 people? Or just about then, 10,000, 20,000, I can't remember the figures right now, that are actually worth $1 million in Nigeria. 200 million people. 10,000. So all those people you are seeing on social media, they run me. Oh, no. <laughs> they are pretenders. They are just posing. They don't have money. Mm. Even the CBN governor said it's only 2% of Nigerians that can boast of having 500,000 in their account every month. 2% of Nigerians that can boast of it. Having 500,000 naira in their account. I mean, 1,000 dollars in the account every month. So, calm down. Eh? Don't pressurize yourself. Don't increase your blood pressure because your secondary school mate is saying, hey, I have arrived. One car is there. One this is there. Ironic. It's only 2% <laughs> that has the money. Eh? Let me tell your neighbor, calm down, calm down, calm down. So, this is it. Now, I did my strike for that to look at this 1% of the people. How do I penetrate them? How do I be able to get into their uh, fold, into their mix? How do I get to be greatly influenced by them or get into the place where they are, begin to dine with them because it's in the dining with them that you actually make things happen? Because when the Bible says in the book of Ecclesiastics, chapter 9, verse 11 or 1, yeah, is it 3, three or I can't remember now, uh, that talks about the race is not to the sweep, the battle is not to the strong. I think 9-11, Abby. 9-11. And when you look at that, then you realize that the, what the Bible is trying to tell you there is that the race is not to the sweep, nor the battle to the strong, but time and chance happen to them. Another translation says, being at the right place at the right time with the right set of people. I added that one to it. And you being the right person in that right place at the right time with the right set of people is what makes the change, what makes the thing happen. Excuse me, probably we'll talk more about that tomorrow or later in my second session. But let me just focus on the 1% of the people right now. And I did a research and said, okay, these guys, how do I break into this 1%? Because I know they are programming their children to be in the 1%. And I was so disadvantaged. Why? Because my parents didn't do, they were not even in the 1%. Talk less of me moving me into the 1% then I realized that there are three things that you should do or could do. Once you do one of those things, you move into the 1%, according to research. Mm -hmm. So the first box is that for you to move into the 1%, you must marry a member of the 1%. <laughs> Now, if you're wearing a ring already, your case is settled. <laughs> you can't tick that box. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, some, somebody, somebody said it jokingly, that he said, don't, don't, don't marry for money. Marry for love. He said, it's okay. But go to the place where the rich people are. And they marry for love in, that, in their midst. <laughs> That's a joke. Oh, don't take me. You have to correct this thing in marriage counseling. Let me just do my own and believe it. Now, hope we all know. I'm trying to scan. I'm trying to scan. 18 years, I think. Hope we all know that wealth is not transmitted sexually. Hope you know. Yeah, good. But the likelihood to break in 
is high, according to research. They marry into the rich family. Now, if you are not in that category, you're already married. You wished you heard me before you got married. <laughs> too late, man. Too late, man. <laughs> you can't change your mind, though. For those of us who are not, it's good you, you, you center your prayer point <laughs> into this area. Hey, Jesus. Oh, hey, Jesus. Oh, and everything. Be centering that. <laughs> so, if you can't tick that box, the next thing you're looking at is to tick the second box. box. Uh -huh. The second one is that for you to break into the 1%, you must be born by one of the 1%. <laughs> hey, Jesus, Jesus, Lord. For some of my, so if you are like me, you know, I've given you my historical uh, background, then you know that one was not working. <laughs> break into, break into, be born. I'm not even sure that my grandfather was 1%. Both Matana and Patana. My great grand I'm not even sure they are. <laughs> so it's easy for Dan Guti to be, one, be the richest man in Africa. Because his maternal grandfather was, was the richest in West Africa. During his time. It's easy for Bill Gates to be rich. Because his mother was the director of a bank. And his maternal grandfather was the chairman of a bank. Uh -uh. If your father is a Lumelu or Jimovia, won't you be successful? So it's easy for Jeff Bezos to be bugging us right now and everything because there was a time his company had a problem and his parents bailed him out so many years back with 200,000 or 300,000 US dollars. He was bankrupt. I mean, those days, $200,000. Jeff Bezos, Martin Al, uh, family. Hmm? They had over 25 hectares, 25,000 hectares of land in Texas. You know, that's not a poor family. So don't mind them when they're saying, we did this. By hard work, we know. But that's not the complete equation. <laughs> that's not the complete equation. So, those people, they said you have to be born into it. Two boxes, you can't tick. I'm sure right now you are praying and fasting. Let the third one <laughs> be tickable. <laughs> Praise the Lord. The third box. was that you must attend an Ivory League school. <laughs> In other words, Afri, Harvard, Princeton, Stanford, Oxford, uh, somebody said you like, don't let me hear that. <laughs> And all that. Well, in Nigeria, if you're smart enough, you get into LBS because there's a way you can do connections there. You try as much as possible to get into LBS because all those corporate guys get in there. I'm not trying to market that, but I'm just trying to tell you where most people go there, not because of what to teach, but what to meet. Mm. You know, sometimes when you go for seminars, you're not going for seminars for what to teach because anything anybody will teach you, if you Google it very well, you will get it. Uh, so you don't go for what... They want to teach, you go for what, who you want to meet. Now, when you look at it, the first box, I couldn't take, me. I don't know about you. Second box, possible. Third one, I didn't take it. Now, am I doomed? No. When you look critically at those three boxes, we were trying to suggest something to you. Because you can be married. We've seen people who married into the 1% that they are not even 70%. They didn't even get close. We've seen people who are in the 
born into the 1%, but they have sold all the properties of the 1%, they are now not even, even in the 70% or anything. We have seen people who went to all those fine, fine schools, but they had nothing to show for it. So it's not in all those places, location. It is more about the dynamics of relationships. More about the dynamics of relationships. So by the time you look at it, there's a common denominator. And the common denominator there is that you move forward. You move higher. You move faster. When you are able to cultivate and build solid relationships. Solid relationships. So if I didn't think being born, if I didn't think being married, if I didn't think being going to an ivory league school, what are the kind of relationships I can start building in my life? Where are the places I'm supposed to find myself in most of the time? That's why church is a beautiful place to be. Because church is a place where a carbonier and a millionaire can be sitting side by side. And then they can interact. And the kind of messages you hear from the pulpit most of the time are live transforming messages. So, where are you? Who are you engaging? Who are you relating with? Relationship is a common denominator. Relationship is the common denominator. Nobody gets to the top. Nobody. Everybody is brought to the top. Mm, did you get that? Did you get that? Nobody gets to the top. Everybody is brought to the top. Somebody pulled you up. But the question is that, can you locate the person? And do you know what to do to get the person's attention? Do you know how to go about building the relationship, solid relationship, that the person will always look at you and say, let us go together. Most of the job at the top are not gotten through interviews. They are gotten through referrals. Nobody can become an executive director based on performance. Now, I'm performing, I'm performing. No, yeah, the best you could be is general manager. But in the board, you cannot be in the board because you're a performer. That doesn't mean you don't perform. Don't get me wrong. But you are always in that board because one of the shareholders is comfortable with you and they nominate you into the board. So what do you do? Start building quality relationships. Start going probably out of your way, breaking sure that all those money that you have been saving and saving and saving and saving and saving, and saving you find a course or a program that you know that who are the kind of people that I will meet here. Because it's easier for you to talk to an Illumelu when you are in the same program with Illumelu for two days. Even if you are not as rich as he is. But for you to be able to stretch yourself and get yourself into that program, it's good. Now, don't start looking at Illumelu. Don't start looking at all those people. There are some people that are very close to your level. Where do they, where do they hang out? Where do they sit? Where do they go? What are the kind of programs they go to? So you push yourself and get yourself there. Sometimes you don't even have the money to pay, but you should have enough sense to be able to get into their midst and then begin to volunteer. Don't start volunteering for them or with them when they're having a big program. Start volunteering when they're having small programs. Start giving your support. Start giving your, your intellectual contributions long before they start having a program. I'm having a program now. I'm, I mean, my program, some of my programs, I mean, I just finished one in a hotel. It's between four to $5,000, and somebody wants to come and volunteer there. Why? It's not possible. How can you come and volunteer there? I'm not looking for a crowd. Selected number of people. We don't need volunteers. But at sometimes I'll be doing a free program. I need to see you there. The people volunteer at the four to five thousand dollar yeah they did but that was not their point first point of volunteering they have volunteered so many years back so they are the one that are qualified we even give them a room 
we lodge them in a the hotel, volunteer. They eat food, and sometimes they get paid for volunteering because it's more like a, a reward for their faithfulness over the years. Are we getting something out of this? Are we getting something out of it? Praise the Lord. So please have this at the back of your mind that it's possible for you to break into the 10% and the 1%. But it's work for you to do. You can't jump into it. You jump there, you jump back. They vomit you. That's why you say, okay, I have, um, what's it called? I, um, you win lottery. Forget it. There's so many lottery winners that are worse off than before they won the lottery. It's just a matter of time. Because if you jump into the 1%, the 1% will vomit you. Because there's a language of the 1%. There's a carriage of the 1%. And we can know. You know, somebody called us, and my staff was telling me from Switzerland. And the camera was telling me that the guy is making 400 million naira. When I asked some questions, I, I've not spoken to the guy. I said, no, he can't. It's not possible. It's not possible. I'm saying, you know, you didn't hear him well. He cannot be making $400 million. Because there is a pattern. There is a, there is, there is a, there is a doing. There is a movement that people are making for, no matter how humble or conservative they could be. There are some things that you hear in their language. So when I spoke to the guy, I realized I was just making about $4 million. As I told you, you can't be making $400 million annually. No matter how humble you are, there will still be pride. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I mean, oh, my God. I mean, you just don't know. I mean, you just, you, you will smell it. I mean, even if you are praying and fighting, they say, wait. When they talk like this, they say, it's just, it's just there. You will smell it. Are we together here? So there is a language. There is a movement. There is something that you must learn. You know, when we read Ecclesiastic 9 verse 11, I know my time is up, but when we learn Ecclesiastic verse 9 verse 11, it said, race is not to the swift, the battle to the strong. Time and chance happen to them. And that's why it's being at the right place at the right time. In other words, you have to be at the right place at the right time with the right set of people. And you must be the right person. You must be the right person. Because you can be in a place where information is flowing and not be able to utilize it. Because you don't have a mind that can comprehend, analyze, digest, and articulate those information. So you on yourself must build up yourself to the point where when the information comes, I can take the information to the city. I can take information. I mean, I was sitting in my house with some young guys and they came and told me some things. I said, Hey, yepa, seriously. Hey, blah, 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 blah. Move money here, move money there. In less than three to four months, I got 20 million naira. Hey! I was there. Where, where have you been? This is all my life. Where have you been? This is all my life. Information. Information. We were in Dubai 2020. We told people, dollars, naira, dollars, is going to be affected just before the pandemic. And we told everybody, move all your money into dollars. Convert it. The ones who listen from there, they started calling Nigeria. Oh, yeah, 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 my move, my move, my room, my dollars, I mean, go and be buying. And they moved it. They got some serious profit. One of my sons who went with me, to Dubai, who had already given me $1,000 that said, I know you want to do shopping. This is $1,000. After we have given him the information, he now came with a check of 360,000 Naira. And I said, sir, can I have my 1000 And we are hearing the same message. I said, 1000 I have spent it. We are keeping dollars, you. When you are saying, God forbid, but now you can see that just being in a space, boom, light bulb moment. 
light bulb moment, light bulb moment. That is what happens to those, all of these rich people, most of these rich people. They're just opportune to be at the right place at the right time with the right set of people. That's why, you know what, understanding mentoring, understanding internship, understanding apprenticeship, very important. Even scholarship is good. Scholarship is not just um, subvention for your um, school fees and everything. Scholarship also means the knowledge you get from a school. So when we talk about scholarship, you get knowledge from a school. And then we talk about internship. You volunteer yourself to go and learn in somebody's place for about two, three months. And then you come back to your space. You see, all those things that you do, you are putting yourself in the right place at the right time with the right set of people. And then there is mentorship. That one is even very deep understanding. By the time I explain mentorship to people, people sack their mentor. Because most of the people you call mentor, they are not mentors, they are just instructors. And most of them are even tormentors. And what they do is to profit from your um, negligence or your uh, lack of understanding what a mentor is all about. And then you have the fourth one, which is the apprenticeship. And our Igbo brothers have shown us that that is one of the best ways of running business. You serve your master for five years. They set you up. They may not know good English, but they understand business. Mm. They may not be able to calculate like you will calculate. But their account is swelling. Papa Emeka was told by the teacher, Emeka's teacher, that Emeka does not know mathematics. So Papa Emeka followed Emeka to the, to the school. I said, no, 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 my son understand arithmetic. So teacher said, he doesn't understand. Say, oh, yeah, ask him. So teacher told Emeka, 12 plus 8. Emeka could do answer. Papa Emeka just laughed. <laughs> and now you are, you are asking the wrong way. <laughs> so Papa Emeka now looked at Emeka, 12 naira plus 8 naira. Emeka said 20 naira. I said, you have not put the naira. <laughs> you have not put the naira. If you put the naira, Emeka will understand. Because everything is about the business. It's about ego, it's about container, you know. Come in, they know the container. Eh? Apprenticeship works. Because they were there, they saw it. Because, check this out, guys. The things that will change your life mostly will not be taught. T A U G H T. The things that will change your life mostly will be caught. C A U G H T. And you catch by observation. You catch by hanging around the successful people. Because there's something called the environmental anointing. Mm. Anywhere a rich man is, there is money in that environment. They may not be spreading the money. You know the money, paper is just a representation of wealth. Mm, it's just a representation. Wealth is in their mind. And as they are moving and they are sharing it, you are getting your own. I don't have to give you a check before you become wealthy. It's the wisdom. The way I move, the way I do things. You catch it by observation. Catch it by observation. Praise the Lord. Don't worry, there's another second session, there's another fourth session, anything. You can see right now that I can go on and on and on. five hours, we are still here. So we just take some questions and um, we take some questions and then we take a little break and then we'll come back. Probably I will be able to look at my slide then and teach you some things that are prepared. God helping me. Do we have questions? No questions. Good. Do you have any questions? No, okay, there's one there. 
Don't worry, once he asked his own question, other people will be motivated. Don't run, don't run, don't run. Take your time. He will wait for you. Um, thank you so much, sir. And good afternoon, sir. And good morning, sir. Now, the, you made an illustration pertaining to the $1 million of a thing. That they, those are the people that are among the set of 1%. That, what you are trying to say is that those are the people that make $1 million annually. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. Now, I'm relating it to the footballers. What they make weekly. Some of them actually make $1 million just in a month. Are you not trying to say that those footballers don't fall among the categories of the people that... What I'm saying is that the $1 million is the minimum for you to be in the 1%. So some people... Bill Gates is in the 1%. Elon Musk is in the 1%. I know they make billions of dollars. But the yardstick for you to be in that 1% is $1 million. So if you qualify, you're in the 1%. But they are ultra, there's something called high net worth individual. You have some people who are ultra high net worth individuals. We have just about, you know, there's the people who are millionaires, the people who are multi-millionaires, the people who are centi millionaires. What do I mean? Millionaires are people who earn $1 million in that category. Uh, multi-millionaires are people who earn ten million dollars in that category, and you have century millionaire who people have a hundred million in that category. You will surprise you that in Nigeria we have about fifty-seven just people who are worth uh, hundred million naira, hundred million dollars category. We have um, less than sorry, less than um, one hundred and fifty something people in the multi-millionaire category. Now, you know Nigeria, most of us, we had our wells. Uh, we saw somebody who already showed us that there could be dollars everywhere. And when he was saying, Emilokon, Emilokon, Emilokon. That one is not counted in, 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 this, uh, in, the, in this whole mix. But minimum entry level is that you have a million dollar and above. Good. Any other question? Okay, since we have no more questions. Okay, you have a question. Good. Why are we taking a break, Pastor Ayo? Why, why, why are we taking a break? Are you guys tired? Okay. Or you are, you are concerned for me? Don't worry. Okay, okay sir. So, my question is really about the marry the one percent. <laughs> Okay, so, um, so as Christians, we have this um, uh, ideology, you know, it's not even an ideology, I believe it's the truth, you know, that you have to, you know, seek the face of God, you know, to marry someone. So, um, perhaps I have um, somebody who um, wants to marry somebody that is not in the 1%, and then has another person in the 1%, you know, and, you know, maybe this person is like my younger brother. You know, and he's saying that, oh, um, uh, this person is the 1% is where my heart is going. And I believe that maybe he, he wants to marry the person because of that opportunity of who the person's father is. How, uh, is that wrong? That, that's what I'm, I'm number trying one, to ask. Number one, number one thing is this. Is... Sorry, sir, can I, can I, okay, because um, the funny thing is that it's not everybody that actually marries for love. Whether the person you marry is the one percent or the person I, is not one percent, I understand you. I understand you perfectly. Yeah. So is it not um, a is it not a thing of maybe like an um, being an opportunist? You know, that's the way I used to look at it. Are you yeah. trying? Is it not? Won't you be like, oh, I'm an opportunist to say, oh, I met this person. This is the person's father, okay. and I want to marry the person Pastor, because you know what? of that. You know what? Let me put a caveat on it now. Now, what I explained to you, no, this is not a marriage ceremony. This is not a marriage seminar. I just told you my research. That they said for you to break into the 1%. The 1% are about 56 million people. And then you have like 7 billion people on this earth. Over 7 billion. Everybody cannot marry the 56 from their family, 56 million. Uh, 
uh, dash them that every member of the 56 give birth to 10, 10 children each. Hmm? They will just be 500 and uh, something, uh, 560 million people. That is if they do 10 million, 10, 10 people though. Then we still have 7 billion people. And you know, when these 556 million are giving back to 10, 10, the remaining 7 billion giving back to 2020. <laughs> so the numbers are increasing. So everybody cannot marry. So I just gave you a research that I saw. And look, that's why I said it will fix everything when I leave. I, I, I think because I told someone recently, I was, I, I, I said it jokingly, but I was telling someone recently that, you know, this lady, I mean, if you go for this lady, she can really affect your life. She can help your life. You understand? She can, you know, and raise you up. And she's not 1%, Abby, or she's 1%. Yes, yeah, she's 1%. She's 1%. So, I, I, you know, I was just, I, I, and that, and I, I, Pastor, let me say this. I think maybe I felt a bit bad because I was thinking, that, am I advising this person to marry? You understand? But you know, listening to you today, no, I don't no, really no, feel no, bad. No, 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 no. Feel bad. I don't feel bad. Don't let my teaching make you feel bad. And please listen to me. Everything is still based on "Thus said the Lord." Yes. "Thus said the Lord," and that was not part of my research. This research was done by secular people. They just went out of people. The easiest way to break in into this mold are through these three boxes. But then, I was able to explain to you that what they were trying to tell us without telling us was building solid relationships. Because we've seen people who, built, who married the 1% that never became 1%. People who got, uh, what's it called, um, uh, were born by the 1%, never became 1%. But what we're trying to say that was just a research to show you that, okay, this is the easiest way, but at the same time, they were a common denominator of building relationships. I have been able to build relationships with people. I wasn't born, I wasn't married to a 1%, but I was building relationships. I didn't even go to an ivory league school, but I've been able to break, if, don't let me say, breaking into the 1%, I disclose that to the 1% and everything. And that's um, based on relationship, based on mentoring. Now, even if I'm not married to a 1% or I'm not uh, born by a 1% or I didn't go to an Ivory League school, I can be mentored by a 1%. I can stay in the environment of 1%. I can learn some things that even their children will not be able to learn because probably they will be spoiled. But I came with a bulldog tenacity, hunger. You understand? So, it is not about what to marry or not to marry. And again, it's always better you don't tell people go for this and don't go for that in marriage. Just explain your point and let them make the decision before they tell you that you are the one who led them. You are the one who, you are the one who, because when the problems, sorry, when the challenges start, because every marriage will have a challenge. You don't want to be uh, put on the cross. You see, you see, when it comes to counseling, even aside marriage, when somebody comes to tell you that this is what God told me to go to Abuja, you are telling me that. In other words, you don't need my advice again. I answer. You ask me, what do you have to say? What can I say after God has spoken? <laughs> Even if I see the wrong, but because you are insisting on the fact that God told you, why do I need to counter God? You are blessed. <laughs> now, I was in Manchester uh, some few weeks back, and somebody said they were leaving to come to a kitty to come and vote that their party. This past election, I said, which party? He mentioned the party. I was trying to advise him, but he was insisting. The way he was talking, his language, his body language was telling me he has made up his mind. So when he left, I told his pastor, please, Tell him that he should not spend his money because he won't win. <laughs> Say he won't win. He should not spend his money. Please tell him to keep his money in Manchester because he won't get the money back. That was what I told him, told the pastor. I hope they told him because they didn't win. They didn't win. <laughs> 
So there are some things like that. When somebody is talking too much, and then you just allow them. But when it comes to marriages also, you must have that balance. Hope you understand what I said about marrying, uh, being born, and everything. It's not I say you should not be looking you know, at people's bank account. They, hello, uh, what's <laughs> Before you can see the guys that are making this one million dollars, it's very likely that you won't even be in their spaces. You won't be in their spaces. When you get into their spaces, you may not even understand their language. You may not understand their language. Because it's a language. There's a disposition. There's a carriage that you must bring into the plate. I mean, I had a program just from a few weekends ago. And then I was called 1 a.m. to appear before a 1%. 1% in times of the money, 1% in times of influence in the Yoruba land. 1 a.m. I got in there. There is a language. There is a carriage. There is a comportment. And the guy, sorry, should I call him a guy? They call him a deity anyway. He came to my program in 1 a.m. I saw him for the first time in my life, 1 a.m. at night. And he came into my program the same day by 12 p.m. And was announcing that he get crashed. Because there's a language, there's a carriage. That's the way you appear. And you must not sound beggarly. Even if you're hungry. You must be careful. And I'll take you out. Okay, yeah, Lord, yeah, let's go and eat. And you now saw food. That's when the worms in your tummy, my visit shouts, prak, 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 prak. Hey! This is food, this is food. You better be careful. You better be careful. That's why you now begin to pack. Pack this one. And then pack that one. Pack this one. And then the spaghetti is now dropping, almost dropping from the plate. And you're now going. And they're looking at you. They may be smiling. <laughs> and you know what they're telling themselves? Continue what you buy more. He won't get in here again. I'm serious. You go to parties. That you think people are not seeing you? Rice passes, you, you eat, amala, eat, and everything. Say, I'm trying to be myself, oh. I'm trying to be myself, oh. God help you. <laughs> God help you. You are not speaking the language. You don't, and you don't come before greatness and start asking for help. You have disqualified yourself immediately. You don't ask for help. You don't sound beggarly. You deliver your point and let it be. Sometimes you may not get it. Sometimes you are hungry, but you see the food, but you don't still eat. And you pick it because they are watching you. The 1% don't eat recklessly. They pick their food because they are not always hungry before they eat. And most of us who came from my background, we are hungry before we eat. <laughs> so you can get into a space, and then before you know what's happening, you are wondering why they didn't come back, why they didn't get back to you. You messed up the opportunity. With your unconscious acts, and then you're asking yourself, ah, what did I do? Kinimoshe, kinimoshe, kinimoshe. You did a lot of things without knowing you did a whole lot of things. I would never get into the presence of any one percent and ask for a favor. Never. For what? For what? Even if you have the thing that I want, today is not the day for it. Today is for you to know who I am. Know my vision. Know my disposition to life. Let's get into a conversation. Not one single, can you help me do this? Can you give me this? Can you give me that? Rather, if care is not taken, I am giving you stuff. I'm giving you stuff. Hopefully we're able to dig deep and then go deeper into all this so-called um, common sense that are not common. 
so-called common sense are not common. People, you get into a space, you bond the opportunity immediately. Yeah, I know. It just started. I know. Oh, you guys want to go and break? You know, it's adult education. You have a question? Okay, quickly. Don't worry, we'll flow, we'll flow. We have a lot of things. You can take your... Yeah, good morning, sir. Yeah, good morning. What's your name? Sorry, my name is Engineer Rex H. Kemen. I didn't get that? Engineer Rex H. Kemen. Okay, good, correct. Yeah, sorry, my question is, what can someone do when you find yourself in a situation whereby somebody takes as a mentor most of the time don't really want to carry along because he sees you as his competitor. He sees you as a rival because both of you are the same line of business. Okay, he doesn't want to take you along. He's hiding his trade secret from you, which is normal. If he's not secured, he will hide it. If he's not secured, you hide it. Now, it's now your job to make sure that he's calm and he doesn't feel threatened by you. Do you understand? It could be difficult to do. But you have to put in the effort to show this person that, look, I'm not going to be threatened by you. I'm not going to threaten you. And then you are open. You are an open book before the person. Hmm? You don't start doing things behind. You don't start taking his own market share. And then any opportunity that you have, if you want to learn from him, you make the opportunity known to him. That this is the opportunity that is out now. Sir, what do you think? So it may feel secured, it may not. But in the case where you have tried all the things that you can try, and then the person still feel that, uh, you still feel like the person is not being open to you, then the person is not actually the right mentor that you should have. Because most of us, we don't get this mentoring things right. Because actually, when you look at the word mentor, and you do a deep, dive into this word to understand it, then you know that mentor is not an English word. Mentor is the name of a man. Is the name of a man. So this man did some few things in his life that they now put his name as a principle for people age, age generation after generation that we are not studying in school. So when you hear mentoring, they give you a whole lot of breakdown, a whole lot of analysis about the word, but it's the name of a man. So if you want to understand the word mentor, then you need to look at this man. What did he do? How did he do it so that to the point that they brought his name as a principal? That helps you. And it's the story of Odysseus. How many of us saw the Trojan War? You heard about the Trojan War that went to fight, and then Hercules, you, you remember Hercules? The guy who buried Hercules was Odysseus, was the one that survived the Trojan War amongst almost the, Greek, the, the kings in the Greek um, colony in those times. So when he was leaving for that Trojan War, you know what he did? He took his son, 16-year-old Telemachus, and handed him over to mentor his friend. He is a king. Mentor is not a king. Telemachus was the crown prince. So he took Telemachus to his friend, mentor. He said, I'm going to this war, and I'm not sure if I will even come back. And I'm not sure how long the war will take. You know the war took a long time. Don't be fooled by the one hour that you watch Troy. It was a long war. And even when Odysseus was coming back to his um, city, the, according you know, to the Greek mythology, according to the Greek mythology, the god of the sea, frustrated him from getting to his, um, his domain on time. So he took his son Telemachus to mentor and said, you know what, true time, bring him up in the way of life. All the things I could have done for him, but because I'm not going to be present, you now do it. You know what that means? That means mentoring his foster father would be his father. While I'm away. Now, when you look at somebody who is insecure, will he be insecure like that with his son? No. So, does he tick the box? He doesn't tick it. He's just an instructor. Use what you can use and move on. 
Mm. Now somebody say use. How can you be using? Everybody is being used. And all of us, we are using people. Mm. So use is a common denominator. <laughs> you are used and you are using people. Shikina. There's no two ways about it. There's nothing wrong in being used. Use becomes wrong when it's only one-sided. If I'm using you and you can't use me, it becomes an abuse. If you're using me and I can't use you, it becomes an abuse. So you use me, I use you. I use you, you use me. Everybody, God is using you. He said, go and preach the gospel to the whole world. After you have preached the gospel, come back and ask me of anything. In other words, let me use you. After I've used you, then you come back and then you use me. <laughs> we are all using ourselves. Do you understand? So one, is he a foster father? No. Two, one thing you need to realize about the story, mentor story, is that mentor did not do the job all by himself. The goddess, um, is it Athena? Athena took the form of mentor. And Athena is the goddess of war, goddess of wisdom, goddess of art and craft. That's entrepreneurship in the short, in the short uh, what's it called? Short uh, explanation. Athena will now take the form of mentor. In other words, she transformed herself to mentor. And I start teaching mentor. I start teaching Telemachus what Telemachus needed to do. One of the qualities of a mentor is that they play the role of a semi god in your life, they open doors of opportunities for you. They don't hide opportunities. They show you opportunities that you can't even see. So if a guy is not doing that, if a man is not, a woman is not doing that, they do not tick the box of a mentor. Mm. Athena did not end there. Athena took the form of mentor and came to Telemachus. And they both went on the sail to go and deliver Odysseus from the raging sea and brought him back to his domain. One other quality, what qualifies you as a mentor is that you are ready to go to war with your protégés. You don't just allow them to be struggling in the marketplace. You appear in the marketplace and let everybody be calm. The story of mentoring that really shook us was when a young lawyer was envious of the senior lawyer and then he was complaining that there was no brief for him. So he said, and then this senior lawyer, he got to know that the senior lawyer was turning down briefs. He now walked up to the senior lawyer and said, okay, this thing that you are doing is not good though. You can't do all these cases. This small one, why not just direct it to me in my office there so that I can do with the small one? The senior lawyer said, no, that's not how it is done. So the junior lawyer felt as if ah, this man is not being reasonable. But the senior lawyer did something for him. So when they were walking, he walked with him, put his hands over his shoulders, and they were talking on the street. From his office, they crossed the road together. And then got to the other side. Shook his hand. Said, you know what, thank you for coming to my office. And they went back to his office. That was the game changer. People saw him. They said, eh? So he knows this brilliant guy. Ah, that means he must be brilliant. Oh, wow. This man that we can't get all the time. This one should be able to be affordable. And they started going to him. So, can your mentor appear with you in public and not be ashamed of you? Can he open doors for you? So by the time you look at all this and then you realize that what we've been calling mentoring, mentoring, mentoring is fake. 
have one of my books here, probably you get it. I explained in one of the chapters, it's called Individual Competitiveness. Do we have it, Kenny? Yeah, get it, read it, understand it. It's called the people around your life who are your mentors, who you call your mentors. Most of them are your instructors. Mm. Mm. Anybody who doesn't call you, at least once in three months, is not your mentor. You are just his protege. He has not recognized you as his own protege. Because by the time you even study the word protege, then you understand what this thing means. If I call you my protege, you know what it means? Because the word protege itself is not an English word. It's an old French word that means somebody that you are vowed to protect. So if you call somebody protege, what you are telling anybody, uh, before you shoot him, you have to shoot me. The bullet must pass through me before they can touch him. How many of your mentors can say that about you? That's why when people gather 5,000 people and say we are mentoring, I say it's calm. It's calm. How many people can you know? Even Jesus Christ did not try that. First started with the 12. Amongst the 12, there are the three. And the maximum is that the ones that he has 70, sent 70 out, you remember? And then the best of the best he ever had, when that ship is 120 at the upper room, when the spirit came down upon them, and they started speaking in tongues, 120. Somebody now gathering 5,000 people, 3,000 people, and says he's mentoring. It's a commercial venture. <laughs> he wants to sell his book. <laughs> he wants to sell his book. He wants to, there's something he wants to sell, a product. I say mentor, 5,000. Mm -mm. The only way you can mentor 5,000 is that you have successfully mentored 200 people, 120 people, and you have empowered them, and they can also mentor 120 people each, and then 100, so you gather everybody together, but you can't pay attention to everybody, and you can't defend everybody, but you have built a system to be able to accommodate that. But that is not always done. That's why you see people, they only focus their attention on some four people. There was a time Kenneth Copeland was focused on four. Um, Jerry Savell, the uh, Duplantis, uh, Crefford Dollars, and then one, there's always one that is always roaming about, he can always stand, but those three guys, he focuses on them and then give them more opportunities. And then when you even look at Bishop Ridiculous, there are some people he focuses on. When you look at Pastor Adebo, there are some people he focuses on. So you can't be mentored to everybody. You can build layers of mentoring, but you can't be mentored to everybody. So, does he tick all those boxes that I mentioned? Decide on your own. Okay, question. Good, let's go, let's go, don't worry. Is there a program in the evening? No. Okay, let's enjoy ourselves, don't worry. Good morning. My name is Motun, Motun Rala. Okay, Pastor, I have, um, I have so many questions, but I don't know how to ask it. I pray God will help me. But while you were talking, you were talking about building relationships, strategic relationships, if you really want to um, break into that 1%. So it got me thinking, the kind of job that I do, I meet people, I meet customers, like big customers. And sometimes when you meet them, you know that this person is the kind of person that can turn your life around. But what is that protocol to break into that relationship without being misunderstood as being like parasitic or being misunderstood. What's the protocol to that greatness? You know, you said when you meet a great person, don't act beggarly. Don't act like you want to ask for something, but we all know that we're all trying to use each other. So at that time, what is that protocol? Okay, good. What's, what's, what's going to make that relationship to be? Yeah, good. Volunteer yourself to be used. And how do you do that? Whenever you meet anybody, they have their area of concern. Do your research. Find out what kind of projects they are involved in right now. What are the things that they are doing? And then look at whether you have the skill set or you have the relationship. Sometimes you may not have the skill set. I'm not good when it comes to IT, but I have a relationship with some people that I can recommend. I get, you know what, we want to get this guy, you know, I know you are into this project, project, but I know somebody that I can bring and then introduce to you and then we can have this area solved. So I'm providing solutions to them. So what that means is that there's a project that binds us. 
Whenever they remember that project, they remember me. And I came into their life to give them solution. I'm not parasitic. Actually, I am an asset. That's why sometimes I call my mentors and they are in a meeting and they whisper, Lee, 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 yeah, I'm going to go to the meeting. Lee, Lee, yeah, I'm going to go to Let me call you back. Let me call you in the meeting. That's value, even if they don't call back. But the fact that they saw my call and they picked it, they could see my call and say, hey, voila, I'm putting it aside. But if they pick the call and say, let me call you back, let me call you back, I'm in the meeting, it's enough for me, even if they don't call me back. That's value. That shows that there's something that they know about you, that you give value all the time, that for him to be calling, that means this thing is going to benefit me, not benefit him. So in the process of showing them what will benefit them, you now put your own there. And most times they are the one that even ask you, how do we work? What are your projects? What are you doing? Let me give you a typical example. One of the organizations that made me probably the highest paid speaker in Nigeria was Etisalat. And Etisalat worked with them for like six years. Every time I appear on the stage, I mean, I'm talking about 2011 to probably 2016 or 2017. Anytime I appear on the stage, that was when dollars were still about 100, 200, and, uh, you know, it was pounds that was 100, and so it was 200 and something. There was a time dollars was about 100 and something. Right? Yeah, that was around the time. So whenever I appear on the stage, those days, I'm paid a minimum of seven digits. 1 million, 1.4 million maximum. Sometimes it was increased. So if I spoke for 20 minutes and paid that, if I'm, I mean, they made me one of, if not the highest paid motivational speaker in Nigeria. And I didn't end it once. I ended it at least 15 times in a year. Average 10 to 12 times in a year. Going like that for like five, six years. Back to back, back to back. But how did it happen? I already started going to the universities to speak in the universities before I met them. I started 2007, but I met, I had the opportunity 2010. So I was contacted by someone, and everything is still in relationship. There was a meeting of a set of people who were discussing that what new thing do we bring into this thing? Because it is I was looking for people who speak at their. Um, they call it the Merit Awards. They were giving awards to brilliant science students in the universities. And they wanted somebody to come and motivate them so that they can stay brilliant. So they were now looking for a motivation as we have to deal with that. And then somebody in the, uh, what's it called, uh, event company that was in charge mentioned my name because the person saw me in church. Mm, that's why I don't play with church. And then when she mentioned my name, my name was on the list. And when they submitted the name, to Etisalat, there was somebody in the Etisalat team who was a member of my church, who didn't remember me, but you know what? To put my name there, but when they put my name, my name resonated, and then she insisted I'm the one who's gonna do the job. You can see the power of relationship. Power of relationship. It doesn't just happen, nothing just happens like that. If it happens like that, it's one percent. It's not the rule, it is always the exception. So they called me and they told me. Um, blah 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 and he wants to do this for us this and that and they gave me a fee I didn't agree with the fee I said no I'm not doing I'm not doing and they said that the MD of a Salat will be there boom light bulb moment I accepted immediately I'm not I was not interested in the fee again I'm interested in the fact that I will be speaking and the CEO of a Salat will be sitting an opportunity to connect. An opportunity to connect. So I got there, I did a fantastic job. I know I did a fantastic job. And everything, and then we got contact, he gave me his number, he gave me his, what's it called? His card. And then I got to Lagos. When I appeared before him, I appeared with a gift. White man, Stephen Evans, he wrote the foreword of my first book, The Speaker. I appeared with a gift, a book. And he asked me, why did I give him a book? I said, I'm an African man. And Africans, we don't appear before, before greatness, empty handed. Two star. So, you know, it's, it's, it's greatness. So I can't appear before greatness, empty handed. 
You looked at the book. How much is the book? I I'm not even sure the book is even up to six thousand dollars naira. He was flipping through the book, and they're right there. In part of the things I put in the book, in the in the, in the what's it called, in the carrier bag, where all the handbills that I've done while I was going to Delsu, uh, Niger Delta University of Benin, uh, Uniben, and everything. I mean, I was doing all those things there full time, so I put all those handbills there. That was where I wanted him to go, but I didn't ask for it. But the gift came first. I remember I had performed very well. Then he was going through all those things. I saw those things. Ah, interesting. Interesting. He himself pointed to that thing and said, we are already in the campuses, but I think we can work together. I didn't ask him that. Can you people sponsor that? But I was there to solve his problem. I was there to give him a gift. I had already performed. He was in love with me. So it was easy for me to present the gift. And then, like they say, the rest is history. When I was meeting with the director of brands and communication, it was not whether we want to find out whether I would do the job or not. It was more about how will he do the job. They will have to find a way on how we will do the job. Do you understand? And then, every now and then, you have to be... We have to be very, very conversant of the atmosphere of everything around you. Sometimes there is an atmosphere that is created that is not conducive for some discussion. And sometimes they want to push you to some angles of discussion. You don't want to go there. Because that was not your ob that's not your objective. If the discussion can get you into that your objective, then you go there. When I was with the, the Onyo of Ife, I came, I said they get crashed into my program. One year, I wanted to move us into some discussion. He said, let us argue. <laughs> I said, we're not here to argue. You're right, your imperial majesty. He said, okay, 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 it's no argument. Let us debate. I said, don't worry, sir. You're right, we're not debating with you. <laughs> you can win a debate or win the argument but lose the opportunity. Why are you debating? You're right. The atmosphere is not conducive for debating. Because the man came prepared to debate. We are not here to debate. We are trying to find out how you can come 12, a. 12 p.m. the same day to appear at our program. And then we got connected. Simple. So, do I, can, I, can I debate? You know I like talking. I can argue. But well, that was not the situation that is needed. So you must be able to read the atmosphere also. But make sure your language is very, very um, relevant for that um, situation. But always look for area of concern. Area of concern, area of concern, area of concern. Always provide solution. Nobody. And then again, you must know how to also communicate your success stories. Because one thing about the people at number uh, the one percent is that they are attracted by results. So if you can present results immediately, then you have their attention. I was at a function so many years back, and then you that I want you to mentor me. I want you to mentor me. I don't take them seriously. Nobody ever told me I want you to mentor me. That I take serious. So I was at this function one day, and then the the lady who was having said, ah, "There's somebody who's crazy about you here. He has been wanting to meet you. Blah 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 blah." I brought it. You know, like normal, I said, okay, I'm very polite. You see me smiling. But inside me, I'd already made up my mind about you. <laughs> and this guy said, oh, you know, and I made the mistake of asking, tell me about yourself. He's an IT guy. And he said, you know what? I have done, I have about 19 certifications. Gen -gen. Light bulb movements. 19 certifications. Let's sit down. Let's talk. Results. He got me. I wasn't going to pay attention. But he told me about himself. He started with, I have 19 certifications. Even me, I don't have half. So it's a privilege for me to be connected with him. But although he's seen me as a privilege, but I'm seeing yeah, there's so much we can work together. The guy is a chief information officer for all these um, technology companies now. And then we became friends because he was able to show results. What are the things that you have done that when you meet that is relevant to the discussion? 
that when you meet this person, you can tell them, this is who I am. I, am, I have first class statistics from the University of Ibadan. Uh -uh. What are you talking about? Boom, light bulb moment. Light bulb moment. So you must be able to figure out your success stories. Once you figure it out and you know how to package it. Now when I say package, I'm not saying lie about it. There's a way you can present it and it's not lie. For instance, 2005, I got my first one millionaire as a speaker. When I spoke at the Seven Up Bottling Company program, 2005, it was a breakthrough. I have never seen that money at once come to me, 2005. But I can never, now I can say 2001 million. Eh? But then, I would never tell you one million. God forbid. Back to tell you, I remember 2005, that was when I made my first seven digits payment. You know what seven digit means? It's between one million and 9.99999 million. Did I lie? <laughs> you will not be thinking, is it one? Is it two? Is it ten? That's your problem. <laughs> seven digits. That is presentation, without lying. Oh, we grew from 10 people to 20 people. You can't impress some people. 100%, 120%. You are wondering, 120%, their mind will be going from 5,000, it is your problem. <laughs> Probably tomorrow we'll talk more about communication because communication is key. Most people don't understand that. Let me even start talking about that. You know, for you to be great, understanding, and then exceptional, there are some things that you have to do. Let me just, okay, 18 minutes more. Good. Let me just take you guys on a trip. Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. I will ignore you after you. When you're tired, I will be tired. There's no evening program. Maybe. Don't worry, I won't go too long. I won't go too, too far. <laughs> Good. Now, there's something called the critical laws of leadership, which is also the critical laws of success. And anything you do, you can always turn it around and use it effectively. Is it, this is not showing it. Is it showing it? Is it you want to show this light here? That you need to take off these lights. I don't know how that will affect you guys. Okay. You have to move because they can't see this. But if you pay attention to me while they are trying to fix that, how is your camera doing? Can you see me well? Good. You can see me well. Good. Fantastic. So, critical laws of leadership, critical laws of success. You must understand this. There are some laws that govern things. If you're playing football, the laws that govern football is different from the law that governs basketball. In as much as you score with your hands in basketball, you can score with your hands with football. You can see that. So everything in life, whatever you find yourself, there are some laws that govern it. So if you are going to be successful in those areas or become a leader in, the, leader in those areas, you must know the laws there and you must adhere to the laws, practice it, and sometimes know how you can manipulate those laws. I will explain it. Now, there are two kinds of law when it comes to leadership or success. There's the law, we call the law of coercion, leadership by coercion. In other words, if I brought in a gun in here, boom, AK-47, I tell all of you to go down flat, lie down. All of you will lie down, except you are, you have eaten some things in OPC and you are wondering that the thing is still working. Or else you would go down, lie down on your feet. I just coerced you. I manipulated you. But that does not give you the best as a leader. So the next one is the law, leadership by principles, leadership by the laws. Leadership by the laws. And you must understand that this is where strength is. This is where success is. This is where promotion is. Because most of the people you coerced, they don't like it. They are angry. They are looking for an opportunity to get back at you. But when you live based on laws, when you live based on, uh, what's it called, uh, principles, you're good to go. 
And there are two kinds of laws, actually. You have what we call the natural law and the constitutional law. Now, the natural law is that anybody that jumps up must come down. Am I right? Natural law is, governs everything. When you plant a seed, and then the seed will grow. You can't expect an harvest without planting. Am I right? But there's something called the constitutional law, which is, okay, the, the, we saw what is happening in America, 1973, whatever law, they call it the rule and something and stuff about abortion, which was overturned yesterday, and the whole thing is going upside down. In other words, it can be a law that can be overturned as long as it is a constitutional law. And that's why uh, sometimes the constitutional law, not sometimes, most times or all times, the constitutional law can be amended. Do you understand? They can be amended and they can be thrown away. But the natural law cannot. The natural laws cannot. And interestingly, when it comes to success, when it comes to leadership, it is always centered or in the circle of the natural laws. In the circle of the natural law. And the natural law is what we call the God-made laws. And the constitutional law is what we, all, what we call the man-made laws. The man-made laws. The man-made law can be amended. Can be thrown away. Military government can come and say, 1999 constitution is not going to apply again. Okay, you can be looking at that there. So the, 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 the 1999 is not going to apply again, and that takes away the constitutional law of Nigeria. They come up with another one. But the military cannot say, okay, because I hold a gun, I will jump up, and then you won't come down. You will come down. So when you look at it, now you begin to look at the natural laws, even with the fact that natural laws cannot be amended, but I always tell people the natural law can be temporarily suspended. Yeah. And then, I can't control my slide again, can you? Okay, yeah. When it comes to success, the secret of success is what is the ability to study the law. Eh? You study it, you find out every law that governs your area and everything, you understand it. Understand it, and then you cooperate with the law. You cooperate with it. You have to cooperate with it. Because if you don't cooperate with it, the law will injure you, the law will hurt you. If you break the constitutional law of Nigeria, it's just a matter of time. Although we don't do anything too much about the law, but it will hurt you. The constitutional law is more powerful. The American constitution is more powerful than the president of America. And that is why if he's not following the constitution, they get impeached by it. People impeach it because you're not following the law. There's no way they can impeach the American president without going to the constitution. Based on your violation of the constitution, that's why we are impeaching you and removing you. Because the constitution is more powerful than the, uh, what's it called? The president. That's why you have the Supreme Court. Even with the fact that Biden does not like the judgment that was delivered yesterday, he doesn't have a choice but to obey that judgment yesterday. Now, but this is where the magic is. Hello? This is where the transformation is. The ones who are understand this law, they realize that even the natural law can be temporarily suspended, not eradicated but temporarily suspended. And that's where the magic takes place. Many of us, we obey the law of gravity, but there are some people who have been able to temporarily suspend the law of gravity so that they can get some things done faster. And then they suspend the law of gravity with the law of aerodynamics. In other words, if I have to go from here to London, somebody just rode his bicycle or my motorcycle from London to Nigeria. It took him almost two weeks or something. Even Google will tell you how much you take you when you want to walk. Uh, Google map, when you want to go by road, it will take you the number of days. But there are some people, because they understand that everybody obeys the laws of gravity, they were able to come up with the law of aerodynamics. And when aerodynamics is in place, you know what happened? It suspends the law of gravity. So instead of me spending two weeks or 14 days or 14 months to get into London, I can get to London in six hours. Do you understand? So what is that understanding you have about the laws that you can use one? And again, look, let me say this. You only use a law to suspend the other. Remember, you cannot eradicate the natural laws. 
or you can use one law to suspend the other law. Same thing with the law of time and seasons. When it is uh, Amatan, it is Amatan. When it is what is called um, 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 rainy season, it is the rainy season. When it is winter, it is winter. When it is summer, it is summer. But you know what? Even if the season is hot uh, season, sunny season in Nigeria, in this room, you know we have suspended the law. We have suspended the law of times and season with the law of thermodynamics that works with your AC. Same thing is that law that suspends the law of what's it called um, uh, winter by introducing the laws of thermodynamics in the house. Although once I step out of that vicinity, I can't dress like this again. I have to I have to pad up. But while I'm in the house. I have temporarily suspended the, times, the, the law of times and season with the law of thermodynamics. Do you know what I'm talking about now? So I can be free, I can get so many things done because I've understood the fact that for me to get something tangible out of life, I must understand how to suspend laws with laws. Remember, I will repeat it again, you cannot eradicate a law with a law. You can only suspend a law temporarily. Rarely. And when it is suspended, you get whatever you want to get done quickly and then make sure you go back to learning that other one because time will come and the demand for those law will come. But you know what? You have gotten whatever you want to get done quickly. In as much as we say relationship, 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 that's the law. But you know that even if you got the job with a relationship and if you're not competent enough, the same relationship may pull you out. So I quickly got this job based on relationship. I need to quickly start studying to, 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 to prep up my competence level. Because by the end of six months, I will be appraised. And if the appraiser is failing, the relationship may still answer for me. But 12 months, the relationship may still answer for me. But after 18 months or 24 months, the relationship will not work again. So you were able to suspend one law with another, but you didn't go get the law so that you can be balanced because you can never eradicate a law with another law. You can only temporarily suspend it. So when it comes to this, then you need to start sitting down and figuring out what are the laws, what are the things I'm supposed to put in place, how am I supposed to conduct my life, what are the things I'm supposed to be learning. When it comes to leadership, when it comes to success, now there are too many laws that govern success or covers leadership, but I was able to streamline it to seven. Seven laws. And um, if you can, it's in this book. It's called The Laws of Leadership. It's in this book. My leadership book is called The Leadership Quadrant. So there are seven laws. Then you have the law of credibility. Uh, okay, let me use it. I can't see that. You know, the father something is from you, and you can't see, should tell people your age. Mm. You know, you know people are getting old. When they hold the book and they do like this, you can't predict their age. <laughs> now, you have the law of credibility, you have the law of communication, culture, courage, um, creativity, collaboration, and compassion. Those are the seven laws. Now, while I try to get all the seven laws, I must get it. I must be compassionate enough. Because if I'm not compassionate enough towards you, there's a way you won't receive my message. You'll be listening to me, but you will not be able to receive my message. My message will not be able to penetrate you. But the compassion with which I came in here has opened up your mind to be able to receive what I'm saying. It was deliberate. It was very deliberate. And uh, good. So the first thing here we want to talk about is the credibility. And you can see the credibility is actually specifically placed in the middle. And there was a reason for it. The other ones are all around the circle, but this is placed in the middle. And how do I mean? This is the center of everything. Remember things fall apart? Remember things fall apart? You remember? Remember? Junior Achebe? Things fall apart because what? The center cannot hold. And once the center cannot hold, you know what happened? Mere anarchy is loosed upon the earth. Credibility is the anchor of all the laws. Credibility is the anchor of all the laws. 
whether success, whether um, leadership, whether anything, whether entrepreneurship, credibility is the anchor of all the laws. And when we talk about credibility, we're not just talking about character alone, we're also talking about competence. Character and competence. It's not just being good. You have to be good on the job. And it's not just being good on the job, you have to have the character. Because most of the time, you realize that some people who try, to, who are good character-wise, but they're not good on the job, they are not credible for the job. And some people are very good on the job, but character-wise, they are lacking. They still do not fulfill the mandate of credibility. I explain it this way. Just imagine that you're going to Majuguri. Majuguri. You know, if you leave Lagos to Majuguri by road, you're probably going to spend like 48 hours to get there. 48 hours, two days. Just imagine you got to the bus stop or you got to the car park and then you were there at 5 a.m. and then you were waiting for the car to be filled. You were in the one bus. My do guri straight, my do guri straight, my do guri straight. I said, okay, my do guri, I will enter. You entered my do guri and then you were sitting in the front. And it was right before your korokoro eyes that the old bus got filled. Then you know, because you've been there since 5 a.m., then you notice that some people under the tent. You know what they do under the tent in car parks? They are drinking paraga, drinking everything, Chelsea, Shekwe, and all those things. They were drinking and drinking and drinking. And then your boss got filled up. And then lo and behold, they went under the tent to go and bring your driver. And when your driver was coming, now, you see where that white board is? That was where your car is, was. And the driver went this way. And they had to direct the driver. Way this way. And then when the driver got there, he was looking for the door. The door hole and the door handle. So they opened it for him. He sat down at the driver's seat. The next thing, he was now looking for the key hole. And then you were sitting in front. You could smell the alcohol. And you now say, ah, you wanted to get down. The conductor just blocked you. Where are you going? Said, this one is our driver? Said, yes. Said, no. Said, don't worry. This guy's been driving this since 1960. Mm. Are you going to go to Maduguri? You can see still manage to Shagamu. Where I come from is about 40 minutes. You can manage. But 48 hours. You push the conductor away. God forbid bad thing. And then you ran to the next bus. Then you sat down. You know you've been there since 5 a.m. So you notice that the driver of this particular bus didn't join them under the tent. Hmm. So when you got into the bus, you realized that he was listening to praise and worship songs. Okay, okay, fantastic. Then he was listening to Pastor Ayo's message. He said, hey, was you? Okay, okay. So is this one? And he said, yeah, church going on, I don't know. But Bah, bah, high five. And you say, why did you join them? And the time said, no, 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 no. I'm a very disciplined man. I'm, I'm a Christian. I don't do alcohol. I don't do all that. And you were so glad. Hey, this is so awkward. Hey. I said, can you imagine that driver over there? Drunk. And the stupid conductor was telling me that he has been driving since 1960. And I made a mistake for asking him, how long have you been driving? He said, no, no. the first time I touched the steering was yesterday. <laughs> now, if it's Shagam again, <laughs> we can manage it. We can manage it. But 48 hours, two days. Will you go to Maduguri that day? That's exactly what happens to your leadership. The first guy was competent, but no character. The second guy had character, but no competence. They can't lead you. So until you put those two things in place, you can't lead. And that is the center of everything. 
You must be good at what you do. And you must have the character to go with it. One is not enough. The two must go together. Because a coin is not a coin. Until it has two sides to it. And the two sides do not show the same thing. They are showing two different things. That is what makes you competent. And character makes you credible. And when it comes to success, you must have that credibility, integrity. You may get away with it. But I tell you, nobody breaks the law and breaks principle and gets away with it eventually. You may get away with it initially, but eventually, the principle is coming for you. Take it or leave it. Those people who broke the principles of governance in Nigeria for the past seven years, watch out for next year. You will see drama. Because they realize, they, they fail to realize that power is transient. Mm. You will see drama. The way they went after the ones who were before them is the same way they will go for them. But when you don't break the laws of credibility, it qualifies you. It's like a visa. It's like a passport, sorry, that you need to travel. You know, without a passport, you can't travel. You can't travel. So you need that. So aside that, which is the center, then the next one you have to be thinking about are all the other six. I will try as much as to take as much as I can. The next one there at the top there is, let us take, what's it called? Communication. Communication. Look, you can have good character. You may know the job very well. But if you do not know how to convince me that to the point that I will believe that you know the job, as far as I'm concerned, you do not know the job. You do not know the job. So everybody who wants to be successful or lead in their life must know how to communicate effectively. I always tell people this, if you have to break the bank, what I mean by break the bank, you know what, empty your account to learn how to speak is a skill that you can never do away with. Because look, if you know 100 things, but by the time you open your mouth, we feel you know 10. We will only pay you for 10. But if you know 10 things, and then you open your mouth, and we feel you know 100, we will pay you for 100. That's the way life is. Life is not fair. Life is not fair. But it's now left to you to be able to present yourself, communicate yourself, communicate what you know effectively, or else you're not going anywhere. And when it comes to communication, you must take note of three things. One, your word. Two, your tone. And three, your uh, body language. Now, your word carries 7% impact. In other words, your Queen's English. Getting your tenses right, which is very important. Tenses right, and then if you've got an accent, use it. As long as you don't fake it. Because in Nigeria, we just get fooled by accent. When somebody is speaking with an English accent, we just feel that they are more intelligent than the one who is speaking with an Ibadan accent. Mm, it is our, it is our, it's our, it's our cross, it's our dilemma, because anybody that comes from abroad is more intelligent than the one who is a local uh, breed. It's not our problem. We are all guilty of it, except me. I'm the one wearing it. You also are wearing all their stuff. <laughs> Don't mind me. That's just to make us laugh. But communication, if you have the accent, use it. Just make sure it's not faked. Just make sure it's not, because I know in Nigeria, once you start speaking with a British accent or with an American accent, they just feel that you're more intelligent. Mm. Mm. Do you know that, apart from that, let me even go further. Do you know that naturally, or no, not naturally, um, perception-wise, she will be considered to be more intelligent than her. You know why? Because people who wear glasses are red and red. That's our assumption. They are red and red and red, and their eyes are faulty. So they put glasses there to continue to read, and then that could be deceptive. And when you now put the two of them in the same thing, now realize, well, ah, these glasses is recommended or shall commend <laughs> Do you understand my drift? 
So you must have that everything you're doing is communication. It's not only when you open your mouth that you're communicating anyways. The way you talk, the way you carry yourself is communication. The way you dress is your communication. Most people don't know that. They just walk anyhow, talk anyhow, do everything. You are communicating every... You see, when you wake up in the morning and people start seeing you, you're already communicating. Your children, you're communicating to your children. When you don't have your bath until 5 p.m. or something, you are communicating to your children. That's why they always find it hard to have their bath. When you follow, okay, oh, hello, well, hello, hello, well, but you, you have no well, hello. <laughs> you are communicating. Your words will not carry that impact. Are we together here? So, your words carry 7% impact. Get it right, because that's the foundation. If you do not get it, get your pronunciations right. Hmm? There's nothing wrong with seeking or information. But there's everything wrong with that when you are speaking in Obodo Yimbo. They're wondering, what is seeking? What is information? And everything. You must get it right. Really, you must get it right. Those words are very, very important. She doesn't even know what information is. <laughs> okay, now let's move on. Are we together? Are we together? Are we together? Now, that is the word. 7%. Get it right. Foundation. Then you have the tone. The tone is 38%. 38%. There's a difference between... 38%. There's a difference between... I love you. And I love you. Same sentence, two different minutes. Same words, two different minutes. What made it different? My turn. I am sorry. And I am sorry. Same sentence, two different minutes. So what you have to say is not more important than how you say it. I hope you don't understand that. So you must have that at the back of your mind. You use your emotions to pass across your words. So sometimes we don't understand what you're saying or we don't believe what you're saying because you're using the wrong emotions as a vehicle to say what you're saying. You can't apologize effectively if you are still angry with me and if you still feel that you're not supposed to apologize. It will color your apologies. And I say, he has apologized, but I didn't hear his apology. I, I was there and I said, I'm sorry, but I didn't hear it because there's something about your tone that impacts on your communication. So that's why we look at all those areas. When I'm talking to you, I'm looking, I'm even done an extra of who you are, your personality. I've placed you somewhere in your personality. And I can determine what I will say to you that will get you angry and what I will say to you that cannot get you angry. Mm. For instance, my brother in blue's blazer, if I tell him he's stupid, he will tell me I'm stupid back. And he will fight me on the street. I mean, he's ready. Yes, he's ready. Same thing with the one behind him. He will fight me. I will be sorry for my life. I'll be sorry for my life. He may fight, but you should take him time before he fights. Before he fights. You see? Why is he saying I'm stupid? You take him time. You, engineer, you will fight me immediately. <laughs> I will fight me. <laughs> you will fight me. I'm trying to look for the one that would take him time before he tries to fight me. Ah, they are not in your church, your pastor. <laughs> Jesus is Lord. <laughs> I did not try with the guy with t-shirts. <laughs> fight with. <laughs> now you can see now just by looking at people's faces it actually determines how I communicate with them. It's a skill that you must learn. It's a skill that you must learn. Because you can tell somebody are you stupid 
the person considers this a question, and they ask you, I'm not stupid, though, and they continue with their life. When you come back to me and say, sorry for telling you that I, I ask, saying that you are stupid, say, eh, did you say that? They've forgotten about it. They can't even they can't even remember. But there's some people. You tell like this. Is a, you know, are you stupid? Is not an abuse. It's a question. Uh -huh. And they start playing it. Am I stupid? Why did they say I'm stupid? Uh, what did I do to warrant that? Who does he think he is? And then God help you. If somebody in their family has been telling you, are you stupid? Are you stupid? Are you stupid? And they don't like the family. They don't like member. Say, no wonder. He's sounding like me in my family. They're always telling me, Am I stupid? Am I stupid? You are in trouble. Do you understand? So, communication demands from you that before you say a word, you ask yourself, how would this person interpret it? It's powerful stress that every leader must pay attention to. Because there's something called the frame of reference of everybody. All of you are frame of reference. Your frame of reference is a is a summation of your experience, your, your education, your exposure, and all those things. Your, the way you're coming from, your personality. Everybody translates whatever you tell them through their frame of reference. So you must consider the person's frame of reference before you start communicating. You must consider that. You must consider the community that you're in before you start communicating. For instance, now there was a time in Lagos, that you can't know for the time in battle, you can't tell them that eh, when we go to speak there, that you have to move, you have to make things happen, you can't just sit in a place, you have to do more work because in a battle, even when the car passes them, the car will still reverse. Come and pick them in Lagos. You don't need to tell them during the time of Mulwe, you don't need to tell us you need to move, you need to do this because. <laughs> Life waits for no one. Molue. You must have been citing the Molue. <laughs> and then, why the Molue is going? You're already running. Why <laughs> Olati On the move. Even the Molue, your bus stop. It won't wait. It will just press brake small. <laughs> you have to come down. And God help you if you land like this. <laughs> You're gone. So, when you land, you are landing on the move. Ah. I go on my coney, yeah, correct guy. So you can see two cities so close to themselves, but different frame of reference. When it is that took me out, I was speaking at a particular year on the spirit of entrepreneur, enterprise, encouraging people to start having that spirit of enterprise. You guys need to start business. When I got to Abba, it's a wrong message. How can you be telling somebody in Abba that you should start business? Abba? When they have started business in their mother's womb, while their mother is counting money, they're already counting it in the womb with them. They are natural businessmen. So you can't communicate the same way you communicated to people in Ibadan with the same guy in Abba based on entrepreneurship. I had to change the whole thing. How to sustain your business. <laughs> that is the message for them. You can see how communication right now is very important. You must be able to understand the person. It's called tact. Tact is you understanding how the person will interpret whatever you're saying. So to lead is not easy. All these things have to be brought into the book. That's why I say if you have to break the bank to understand how to speak, you need to break the bank. I don't break the bank is that empty your account if need be. It's a skill that is forever going to be useful to you. And with your permission, if you don't mind, I have a program coming up on the 20th and 21st of August. I will tell Pastor Ayo how he can use, I will give him a card, a discount card. card. Anybody who wants to come, has to come through it. It's going to happen 10 hours. And what we're going to be discussing is it's called the Public Speaking Masterclass. Public Speaking Market, 10 hours, Saturday, Sunday, Sunday afternoon, Sunday afternoon, somewhere in Victoria Island. Second, sorry, 20th and 21st of August. You need to be there. 
Look, don't be scared. Whenever the people hear that Nia, this one has a program, you're wondering how many thousand dollars is it? No, this one is a bit, uh, it's quite affordable. Quite affordable. But we'll pass the message across to Pastor. Anyone who's interested, we'll get you a good discount to be there. And once I have the number of people that I want to have, I will close the doors. Because that's to be some, the number of people that I can easily relate with. But guys, listen to me. Communication is key. You are a doctor, you know how to communicate more, you get more jobs. You are a lawyer, you know how to communicate more, you get more jobs, you get more briefs. Even you are a staff in your office, you know how to communicate and make presentations, you get more opportunities. I tell people this, that whenever they want to make presentations in your office and you are saying, oh, no, ah, no, me, I can't make presentation, no, but I will gather the point, yes. We don't remember you when the presentation goes right. The only time we remember you when, when the presentation goes south. I ask you, ah, who did all this? Did I point to you? <laughs> he collated all the points. That's when. But when the thing goes right, the guy who made the presentation is the one that shines. He won't even say, and then there you are, you are angry. Mm, and I'm, it's me that gathered all the research. It's me that did it. He won't even point to you. He will just take the accolade. And the more you speak in your organization effectively, the more opportunities that you have to get to the top. So you must have that communication is absolutely important. The tone, and then the last one there is your body language, which is 55%, 55%. You must be able to use your body in conveying your point, your mannerism, the way you stand. Somebody who stands like anyhow, I say, I'm confident. Will you believe? It's standing like a disembodied spirit. <laughs> and sometimes when you when you when you want to show to people you're confident, the way you smile, the way you even the way you even relax your faces and everything makes people believe that you are confident. So your body language is very important. What's your name, please? Mutunola. Please, can you come? Please, can you come? Now you can see. She didn't come. Eh? Why? Because action speaks louder than words. I'm saying, can you come? It's easy for her to come. Do you understand? Because I'm saying, can you come? And I'm doing this. But she didn't come. So sometimes, because she didn't use your body language to strengthen what you're saying, you get us confused. You're telling us some things, but we're reading some other things through your body language. So that's why we're confused. That's why we don't listen to you. That's why we didn't remember what you said. And you're angry with us. No, be angry with your body language. And you must understand how to work on it. That's communication. Then you have courage. Courage. You know we said something about strong will. Eh? Say something about strong will. Courage is key. You cannot make progress in life without being courageous. You can't. It's not possible. Because of, you'll be playing the small boy's game when you do things without courage. Small boy's game. You'll be playing one side game like that and people will be looking at you. You can't be a game changer. You can't be a game changer if you don't understand courage. Courage is key. One of the things that brought me to this level that I am in right now is because I am crazily courageous. Ah, no, no, forget about it. I'm ready to fail. I'm ready to lose money. But you know what? There's a point you get to that even fear, we know that you don't respect. And you know what happens? Fear will now run away from you. Failure knows that this guy does not give a damn about me. He doesn't care what people will say. So failure will leave you alone because it doesn't affect your emotions. That's where courage comes in. Have I had a lot of programs that failed? Yes. They didn't know about it. You wouldn't know about it. I will not be telling you about my failures. The ones you hear about are the ones that I succeeded. If you were the one, which one would you tell me? Which one would you tell me? But there are many, behind every successful man, there are many years of failures. But because he won't say because he failed or she failed, and they won't keep pressing on. 
Courage can truncate God's prophecy. Lack of courage can truncate God's prophecy over your life. Bible says, God said, no, no, there's a song that we sing. God said it. I believe it. That said to see. We won't be that. God said it. Hey, I believe it. That said to see. We won't do leg work. Don't worry, I can't do leg work. <laughs> God said it. But have you read Joshua chapter 1? Verse 3, verse 5. God said it. Nobody will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Whatever the source of your people will tread upon, I've given you as your possession. That was not a prophet telling Joshua. It was God telling Joshua himself, direct message. Not through a proxy. But the same God that spoke in verse 3 and verse 5. Probably saw Joshua going. Say, Joshua, before you go, sit down. Verse 6, verse 7, and verse 9. Say, Joshua, only be strong and courageous. Only be strong and courageous. Verse 6, verse 7, only be strong and courageous. Verse 9, only be strong and courageous. Once have I spoken, twice have you heard. What about if God now speak three times? So, how courageous have you been in your career? How courageous have you been in your life? How courageous have you been? What are the things that you have done that you have never even attempted to do before? You know this thing? Ah! Me, Sherry. Well, are you ready to go all the way? I mean, I tried. You don't, you don't go, you don't come from my background and you'll be organizing meetings in a hotel. A hotel is one of the biggest hotels, if not the biggest hotel in Nigeria. No, in Lagos. Transcorp is also there in Abuja. Many people have tried to go to a quota. When they try to be, they run away. They say, how do you do it? I can't share my secret with them. But uh, on 28th and 24th, I will share the secret. When I'm sharing the secret there, I will tell them to switch off the camera. And uh, that, act, that part, no, 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 I'm not saying they should switch off this one now. That aspect will not be recorded on tape. Praise the Lord. Are you tired? No. Even, even, even if you stop now, I will even enjoy myself. But don't worry, I will just 10, 15 minutes and I will be off your face. I, I may not finish all this. I probably will come back tomorrow and do that. But why should I even finish all of this when I've even written it in a book? Buy the truth and sell it not. Just go there, buy we even know how far you want to go in your life by the things that you purchase. Are they going to enlighten your intellect, balance your emotions, and strengthen your strong will? That's how progress happens. So, 6, 7, 9, God appeared and still told him, be strong and very courageous. And when you read verse 18, the last verse of Joshua 1, the people themselves came and told Joshua, we know the hand of God is upon your life. Anybody who disagree with you, we will deal with them, blah, 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 this and that. They told him everything that he needed to hear. And the last word, the last sentence there, is that there's only one thing we require from you. For you to lead us effectively, only be strong and very courageous. Only be strong and very courageous. So by the time you look at it, without courage, you can achieve nothing. Even a dot seer the Lord can never be accomplished without courage. That's why I tell people that it takes the unity of divinity and humanity to see the realities of prophecies. Unity of divinity and humanity to see the realities of prophecies. You must be able to do that. Your courage must be impeccable you must be ready to bite the bullet. You must be ready to make a move. You must be able to stretch yourself beyond normal. Your mind must be stretched. That's why you need to be around people that will be stretching your mind. You need to be in a gathering that will be making you look that you are stupid. When you are with people that makes you feel that you are intelligent, you are not in the right place. 
You have to go to places when they begin to tell, you begin to tell, ask yourself, hey, Jason, about, I need to read more. These people are putting you on your toes. Not when you now feel like the king. Everybody is now bowing before you. You are the go-to person every time. Are you, do you have people that you go to yourself? So you are pushing yourself, getting yourself in that place. Because the more you spend time with them, the more they expand your mind, stretch your mind for you, and give you the things that you want and you know that is appropriate. Now, I will take this one finally before I, we, we call it a day and then that's going to be creativity. 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 Creativity is very, very vital when it comes to success or leadership. I am always given to creativity. You want to get my attention? Show me some creativity, that, something creative that you've done. And then when you look at Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, the first thing we knew about God is nothing but his creativity. No miracles, no nothing. The Bible says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Barashit Elohim Barak Etashimai Retahares. God created the heavens and the earth. So, if you say you speak in tongues, if you say you have the DNA of God in you, if you say you are created in the image of God after his likeness, then where is your brainchild? Where is that product that you have created? What can we see? Where is that tone you have created? Where is that music? Not just any kind of musical. Music that everybody will be singing, they will see the excellence in that music. Where is your brainchild? We all want biological children, but we don't want brain children. Biological children does not sustain your name. They sustain your name in your family. It's your brainchild that sustains your name in the community, in the country. How I many do you know the children of Nelson Mandela? Do you know the children of um, uh, Bank Anthony? Do you know? Do you know the children of um, Cosmos Maduka? Do you know the children of Cosmos Maduka? Do you know the children of uh, Christopher Colade? But you know they are brain children. Sustains your name forever. So, how is your creativity? You must be creative. Let me also help you quickly. You can then get all those things in this book and then in another book. Uh, individual competitiveness. You want to be creative, the first thing you must do, the first thing you must do, quickly, is to believe that you are creative. I don't care whether they've told you that you're a non-entity, you don't have any sense at all, I don't care. But the first thing to do is to, to believe. Gen uh, John chapter 1 verse 12, as many that believe to them, he gave power to become the children of God. In other words, there are three things you need to look at there. Believe, power, become. Believe, Power become. In other words, there's no problem with the becoming. You don't focus on the becoming. The power is neutral. But the problem is always with the belief. If you don't believe in yourself, if you don't believe you're creative, you know what? Power is available for you not to be creative. Did you get that? So, leave the power alone. Leave the becoming alone. Focus on the believing. Begin to tell yourself over and over and over again, whether they laugh at you, at you or not, that I am creative, I am creative. I am born to be creative. I have the DNA of God in me. I have the DNA of Christ in me. So therefore, if God can be creative, I can be creative and I'm creative. Just keep telling yourself that over and over and over again in front of the mirror, in front of everybody that cares. Just keep saying it, keep saying it, keep saying it, keep saying it. You know what happened? 
you will eventually become it. Because whatever you confess, you begin to attract in your life. You begin to attract creative people, and then you begin to see the pattern with which they get creative. You begin to see the programming which they went through before they became creative. Because those things gravitate towards your confession that has come over time. Believe. And then once you start believing, that belief start expanding your mind. Start expanding your mind. Because without a mind expansion, there's a limit to how far you can go in life. That's why some of us, we go to places to expand our minds. That's why some of my people, you know, in 2020, I took some businessmen to Dubai. And then when we got to Dubai, I put them on the boat, on a yacht. Yacht, 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 yeah, yacht. You know, it could be very tongue twisted. So. Put them on a yacht. People say you're wasting money. I say, <laughs> you think so? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm expanding their mind in the middle of marina at night. They saw colors. They saw high-rise buildings. One of them was a uh, sound engineer or sound uh, stage manager. Every concert, he'll be doing stage management, stage management, stage management. So when we us to Dubai, when he came back from Dubai, he started building houses, three stories, making money. I mean, the guy wrote me a check of one million naira, just like Dash, recently. I saw that change has happened. For him to be able to write a check of one million, Egba. If you can't work then what? But it happened there. Why? We expanded his mind. You can't see colors. You can't see beauty, and your mind will not be expanded. Is that, could that be the reason why the people on the island are making more money than the people on the mainland? Could that be? Could that be? Could that be? The color combination you see on the island is different from what you see here. Could that be the reason why the weak people in the Western world are make, becoming more creative because they have beauty that they see? Even the weak and the strong are influenced by what they see. And Jacob exemplified that when he would take the weak, the strong goats or the strong um, sheep and make them see a particular thing. And when the weak are about to see it, he put the thing away from them because he wanted the strong to be able to bear what they wanted. So what they saw was what they produced. So what are you seeing? Everything you see expands your mind, makes you more creative. And you must be ready to go leave your comfort zone and sometimes go to some places that will challenge your mind. Save 10,000 naira and go to Sheraton. Or 20,000 naira and go to Sheraton for lunch. Starting point. Go to Marriott, Ikeja, for lunch. Sit down there. Eat. Don't be in a hurry to leave. Ask for a drink at the lobby. Soak in the atmosphere. There's something he's doing to your mind. There's something he's doing to your perception. There's something he's doing to your interpretation. Because the magic is not in the event. The magic is in the interpretation you give to the event. It's changing your perspective. It's changing your orientation. It's changing your interpretation. And you begin to look at it. And things begin to change. Why? Because your mind is expanding. Also, spend time with creative people. Spend time with creative people. Spend time with creative people. If they don't want you to come to the inner circle, volunteer and stay around them. Volunteer and stay around them. My programs? Always an improvement, 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 improvement. I go all the way. All the way. Because for me to sustain my leadership, the guys who are following me need to be provoked. They need to be inspired. The day they become more inspired than I am, I lose my place. So every now and then I must be creating some inspirational moment. And that's why my brain must be working. My brain must be working. So creativity, believe, 
Expand your mind. Spend time with creative people. And never allow failure be the judgment of your life. There's a difference between failing in an event and being a failure. Two different things. Because I fail doesn't make me a failure. Do you understand that? Because I fail doesn't make me a failure. When you begin to believe that you're a failure, you always fail. Because you fail does not mean you're a failure. You must get that at the back of your mind and get everything working for yourself. Spend time with people that are creative. Go out of your way. Put some money aside. Pay for some things. Pay to get into some gatherings. And then you will stay creative. I think I will stop at this point. And I will see if I have questions. Someone is already raising his hand, waiting for the question. Is he a member of the church? Don't worry, I will reserve the prayers till tomorrow. Hmm? Because sometimes it's grace. Grace. I will not overrule the place of prayers. I will not overrule the place. Don't worry, I will take your question. I will not overrule the place of prayer. I will never will overrule the place of grace. I believe that grace has an element. It's a strong element. Prayer is a strong element in success. But there are so many prayer warriors that are foolish. They have to be a combination of sense and prayers. They have to be a combination of strategy and prayers. That's what makes it work. When you read Ephesians 3 verse 20, unto him that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above that we can never ask or think. That gives you two dimensions. Asking is prayers. Thinking is strategy. You must bring both for you to be able to access the one that is exceedingly and abundantly able to do whatever you want to do. So if you, don't, if you just only come with asking, you have limited your chances. If you only come with thinking or strategy, you have limited your chances. But if you come with a combination of both, you have increased your chances of getting the all-increasing, all-encompassing God to step into your situation. So good. Let's take your question. So we'll pray tomorrow. Pray tomorrow. Release grace. The grace I have enjoyed. I've enjoyed grace. I, I, I mean, you got only your fifth air to come at your program without prior invitation. It doesn't just happen. Something activated that. Getting Cosmas Maduka who was out of the country, who had to fly in because of your program. And then a day or two later, I flew out and was telling you, I came back because of your program. Not that you paid him any amount, though. It's, it's great, so. That will make a professor part to me. Say, no worry, I'll be coming back at night from Abuja. But if your people can wait for me, I don't mind finishing by 11 or 12 midnight, then I'll go to my house. Tired, but yet, still appeared. We didn't leave Saturday until almost 12 p.m. and 12 a.m. at night. Thank God we're all staying there. It is grace. That grace will be doubled upon us. Amen. We pray and the grace will find expression and things will start picking up. For us, but remember this, it has to be combined with the knowledge and understanding. Over to you, my brother. Yes, sir. Um, Ola Sukomi, Mustafa, is my name. Um, my wife used to be a member in this church before I took her away. Abiola. No, I don't understand. You took your wife away from this Yes. Church. I married her away. What did you marry her to? Uh, well, to my house and then my church. <laughs> Oh, JB, you have married her to my house. <laughs> when will you welcome? I like, I like your sense of humor. Thank you, sir. Um, so, um, I will start with what you've talked with us today. Um, I own a company called 21st Century Evolution Systems. We started, well, officially when we registered the company in 2009. No loans, no external income 
from no external, um, I would say, um, investments. Now we're in Ghana, we're in Kenya, we're in Nigeria. Total staff, they're about 75. We own subsidiaries, Eccentric, Lada, Food Processing, um, Quorum, Digital Media. Just to let you know where I am, sir. So talking about growth today is very timely for me. Um, thank you very much, Pastor Ayo. I usually would not attend seminars like this because I'm like, what, what haven't I heard before? But why I'm standing here is there were some critical things that you said that I've been struggling with. Um, I discussed some of this with Aya the last, Pastor Aya the last time he was at our house. Um, now, you talked about growth, focusing on the process. We've done that. We've grown from little to, let's say, medium size. Now, that critical area of growth, where we need to now step to, where you have maybe four or five people that have really influenced me, but I've never really officially gone to them to say, would you be my mentor? You know, I've never really done that, but they have influenced me. I've also reciprocated with, you know, gifts here, keeping that relationship, stuff like you discussed there. So, what I'm saying here is I, is I need a personal um, time with you. Okay. Definitely we'll work on that. Let me tell you, yes. you know, in practice what I just thought, it started with his company. I was in class. Yeah, I was in class. But let me also help you. I know we'll get to talk more because you become, you are enticing and then very... But let me help you further. In your organization, you can sit, sorry. In your organization, as a leader and as a CEO, there comes a time where you have to be able to change gear. Your leadership must evolve. If your leadership does not evolve, you put yourself in a particular place and you become frustrated most of the time. When you're still struggling to, I mean, based on what you said, sorry if I'm using the wrong words, if you're still struggling to build those critical relationships that you said you've noticed, they've impacted you, you've not been able to take it beyond just um, probably um, the, the intangible to more tangible, I mean, more contact-based relationship, you have limited your growth. You have limited your growth. Because the people you know actually amplifies what you know. The people you know amplifies what you know. The people you know give you more opportunities. So as a CEO, when you start an organization, there's something we call operational uh, activities. You are operational. We buy, we sell. We go look for contract, we execute it. And then money is in the system. We pay salaries, everybody's there. You can have 100 people and you're still operational. So there's a point we have to evolve and start doing what we call operational management. So we, okay, 21st century, um, is it advert? Um, what do you do, what do you do? Okay, good. You do IT and blah, blah, like that, good. So now, in operational management, your core is IT. Yes. But you know you have to manage human resources. You have to manage finance, ma uh, manage finance and everything. So you now move from operation to operational management where you begin to build systems and structures around those things. How do you appraise? How do you appraise? How do you uh, determine what needs to be spent and what needs to not to be spent? and everything. So you start building systems around all those critical areas that will enhance your production. Now, that is operational management. So there's come a time when there is a demand on you to now move from operational management to operational leadership. And in operational leadership is when you don't manage the system. You begin to manage the people that manage the system. Do you understand? Now, at this point, it's not that you don't understand the system. You understand the system. You know how it works. At this point, you're not even supposed to be doing all those um, security stuff with um, Marriott again. You just manage the people that manages 
those systems, and those are the people who go to Marriott and get things done and everything. But even with that, you can't even stay there. There's something we now call strategic leadership. At the point of strategic leadership now, operational leadership, you manage people. But people always confuse operational leadership with strategic leadership. Thinking that strategic leadership manages people. No. Strategic leadership manages ideas and ideologies. But you can't. Are you with me? You can't manage, you can't get into that point of strategic leadership if you have not let go of operational leadership. Do you understand? You can let go, you have to let go of operational leadership. In other words, you have built someone to be able to take charge of managing the people. So you now, where you're now at is one where you're now entertaining ideas. That's why sometimes I build around my clients. I build around them their office. They get a PA, they get an executive assistant, and then they get some mavericks. Some people who, and they notice some mavericks in the organization, and they bring them into a meeting. They brainstorm on ideas. They brainstorm on the culture. They, they, don't, even think of, they don't even talk process. Process management, process reengineering is with, with the um, operational leadership. And most of the time, the operational leader is the COO, chief operating officer. What the strategic leader is the CEO, chief executive officer. And most of the time, the chief executive officer does not even go around what is happening in the offices. You know what he does? He stays in one room, and what he's thinking about is to be free his mind to be able to see opportunities. Where do we need to be? How do we need to approach this? How do we need to do this and everything? If you notice Dubai, the crown prince of Dubai, um, Fars, three, you never see him in the office most of the time. You see him feeding the giraffe. You see him feeding the, the falcon. You see him with the elephant and everything. What are they trying to do? They're trying to free his mind to be able to think. That's why when you see things that are happening there, they are, they are mind-blowing things. You're wondering, what are these people thinking? Most of the things they did there, that's never been done elsewhere. The mind, guy's mind is free to do a lot of things. So he's being programmed so that when his father leaves the scene, Boom, it takes over, and before you know that there's continuity. So you must also, as the CEO, you must get yourself to that point where you free yourself, and then you're dealing with ideologies, you're dealing with ideas, you're dealing with the culture. How do we think in this organization? How do we process things in the other organization? Do we have the believability? Is the Peter didn't get to culture? Everybody who understands culture knows that culture actually builds the individual. Culture actually builds the organization, not the leader. I think it was Patrick Moyer that said that uh, the central conservative truth, the central conservative truth here is that it is culture and not politics that determines the growth of an organization. And he said the central liberal truth is that politics can deliver culture from itself. That is politics leadership can deliver culture from itself. If so, if you want to grow, if you want to expand, if you want to develop, then your attention is on culture. How do we think? How do we do things here? What is the connection like? What is the collaboration like in my organization? Do we have so many, um, so many um, situations where people hug you and they fight? Are there discords, unsettled rift and everything? Or do we live as a family? That's the work of the CEO. And he's looking at the, the, the soft side of the organization. Why the CEO is looking at the hard side of the organization. Now, the CEO graduated from the hard side. is now focusing on the soft side, looking at the culture, looking at the ideas and everything. And then the CEO must be able to free himself. If he does not free himself and get to that point, he will never be able to move that organization forward. They will get to a plateau. And there's the final side of it. It is now called sophisticated leadership. It goes beyond strategy. It goes beyond strategy. Now it goes beyond building quality relationships. Sophisticated leadership was what cost, that what did not cost UBA, Zenith Bank, and all the other guys their license. Like it costed or cost Intercontinental Bank their license. 
because they were both strategic. They were all strategic. Oshone Bank was strategic. But when Salim Silamido came, he came for the first batch. You know, he told us he was coming for the second batch. So sophisticated leadership set in. The Illumilus, the Jimovia, went to the National Assembly. The National Assembly was saying, you can't do that without our permission. You can't do that without our permission. You can't do that without our permission. It's not strategy again, it's a relationship. Who can you call upon that you have built a relationship with? Contrast don't come straight to you like that. Somebody say, you know what, ah, oh boy, have you, be, have you heard about this job? Have you bid it for it? Bid for it, don't worry. We'll make sure that that's sophisticated leadership. The uh, uh, Nigerian Assembly stopped Sanusi, they, they, they gagged him. So he came up with a law that if you have done 10 years as a managing director of any bank, resign. And you can't be in the board until after another 10 years. So those boys set aside and they put their guys in there. And then there's another part of sophisticated called um, regulator capture. You capture the people that are regulating your industry. So when Sanusi became emir, there was room to appoint the next uh, CBN governor. And then they pushed one of their boys, MD Nidbank, to be the CBN governor. And he was made the CBN governor. They talk to the National Assembly, give him a soft landing, approve him. They approve. Jonathan signed. He became CBN governor. And the CBN governor he set aside Sanusi and said, you don't have to do 10 years again before you become a member of the board. And then the Jimovia and the Olumilu came back and became chairman of their bank. <laughs> Sophisticated leadership. So... At a point in your life, you must get to that point where you transit and you build all those things. For every time you are going to another level, you have one competent person to take care of the previous level. But that doesn't mean you can't do operation. That doesn't mean you can't manage operations. That doesn't mean you can't do strategic leadership. But there's a point in time that I even expect you to be in office at all the time. At the point in time, I expect you to be having meetings. Sometimes I expect you to be taking trips to Japan today to, uh, what's it called, to, to America tomorrow because your job right now is not to get the job done. Your job is to bring the job to be done. Your job is to cultivate relationship in case we get into a muddy terrain. I have people in high places that can supply the water that we use to get the mud away. Very important, most businessmen don't know this. I have one of my prodigy, I don't even know whether to call him prodigy or not, because right now what is even controlling, he can buy me, buy my family, buy everybody, he might be, seriously. The guy even on your fever told me that he's the biggest boy when it comes to the real estate industry in Nigeria. When he said, I can tell you, this guy is the biggest. He got into a challenge one time. He's a very strategic person. Young guy, he just clocked 41. Very intelligent guy. Very, I mean, 41 year old becoming, according to Oni of Fever, number one real estate guy in Nigeria. You know, he doesn't get there now. This guy ran into serious problems. His strategy could not save him. So when we extract uh, uh, Kilo Shelley, who do we know? Which politician do we know? None. It became a problem. He was not sophisticated. But we had to go another route. So we now, he now got a lawyer. That is not just competent, that is not just strategic, but sophisticated. He got the lawyer that can easily call the governor of Lagos State or call us a rock. And sometimes you think that some judgments are given in the courtroom. Wait there. God will help you. And I hope with this few words of mine, I've been able to bless you. <laughs>